The woman who answered the door when I knocked had tears in her eyes. She clutched her house coat tighter around herself and took me in, looking me up and down. Miss Burton, I'm Agent Barnes. May I come in, please? She regarded me through the glass, staring coldly at my face. They said you'd be coming. You're from the FBI? Some sort of special unit? That's right, ma'am, I said, pulling on my ID badge and showing it to her. After examining it for a while, she turned the handle, pausing to take a quick look. Hopefully look around the neighborhood before finally holding the creaking screen door open for me. I stepped up the wooden staircase and entered the house. The home was well kept. Old, but comfortable furnishings. Walls covered in framed photos, swirling, showing barbecues and family gatherings. Weddings. Birthday parties. It looked like a peaceful place. Not an abusive household or neglected one, I thought to myself. I took up my notepad and scribbled something illegible. I'm here to follow up on the case involving your son, Brian. Do you mind if we sit down to talk for a few minutes? She showed me into the living room and I took a seat on the couch. Can I get you anything, Agent? Barnes. Uh, no. I'm fine. Thank you, though. Instead of sitting down opposite me, she chose to remain standing, making me feel oddly nervous. I tried to ignore the situation. But it did throw me off slightly. Most people sit down and you do, especially when they're the host. What exactly can I do for you? Well, I'm hoping to ask you a few questions about your son's disappearance. I understand that he went missing from his bedroom late one night and there was no signs of forced entry. The doors were still locked in the morning when you woke up, is that right? She nodded slowly. And this, despite the fact that he didn't have a key and none were missing from the home. She stood with her arms crossed, not saying anything. Was there a question in there somewhere, Agent Barnes? I waited for a beat. This wasn't how I expected it to go. Already I felt like my entire preconception of the case was wrong. My theories were immediately forgotten and I began to examine the whole situation with fresh eyes as I sat there looking into the woman's unreadable face. I suppose my question is, how did he go missing? Seems impossible, unless there's something that you aren't telling us, a door left open, a window, a neighbor with a copy of your keys, something. You have to try to remember. You're singing the same old song that the detective was singing. Nobody else had a key. None of the windows or the doors were unlocked. I'm sure about that. And you're sure he didn't sneak out after dinner to play with friends? No one would blame you if that was the case. Kids that age, they'll, they'll go out to the forest, they'll run around, they'll get in trouble. You're sure he was in his room that night when you went to bed? I'm sure. I tucked him in myself. I'm not a drunk or a druggie, Agent Barnes. I'm not a neglectful mother either. I didn't forget seeing my son in bed that night. Just like I didn't forget to lock up. This was going nowhere, I could already tell. We were off to a bad start. I, I had a feeling that she would sense my newfound hesitancy and uncertainty. So I put my notepad away. And I thought for a few seconds what direction to take. I had to improvise. Can you show me his room? I'd like to see it if I could. Her face showed no change of expression at the request. She just held her hand out, inviting me towards the back of the house. I followed her as she led me down a hallway with creaking wooden floors. Do you have children, Agent Barnes? Yeah. A son. How old is he, if you don't mind me asking? Eleven, naturally. Same as your Brian. Good. Now imagine for a second what it would feel like if you had him taken from you in the night. Despite doing everything possible to stop something like that from ever happening. I hate to think of it. That's a parent's worst nightmare. Here's his bedroom, she said. Opening a door at the end of the hall on the left. Just as he left it. I didn't change a thing. The room was painted a pale blue shade. And there was a small bed in the corner, a desk with a computer sitting atop of it. A gaming console, a small television on the far end with a beanbag chair in front of it. There were no signs of violence or disarray. Nothing looked out of place or broken. A few items of clothing and toys were scattered here and there. But overall, it looked cleaner than my own son's room. Was there anything missing? Any of his belongings, clothes, toothbrush, phone? 
Brian doesn't have a phone. He kept begging me for one, but I told him he wasn't old enough. She broke off suddenly, her face screwing up into a grimace of sorrow. If I'd let him have a damn cell phone, maybe they could have traced it. I put a comforting hand on her shoulder and she let me do that, at least, without pulling away. Even if you had, he wouldn't have had it on him while he was sleeping. You can't blame yourself for that, I told her, feeling suddenly more and more on her side. And just so you know, my son doesn't have a cell phone either, I told her. I told him the same thing. The woman bit her lip, hugging herself tighter. She turned her eyes up to the ceiling, trying to dry the tears within them, as if she couldn't bear the thought of weeping one minute longer. Do you think Brian could have made a copy of your key, maybe without your knowledge? That just maybe he could have snuck out in the night and locked up afterwards? She shook her head rapidly. He's eleven. And no, I told the officers he isn't like that. He's a good boy. I looked over to see the closet in the corner of the room was now hanging open, and just ever so slightly. But I distinctly remembered it being closed when I came into the room. Inside, it looked pitch black. For some reason, I was drawn towards that darkness, and... Uh, I began to walk across the room towards the closet door. What I was looking for within that darkness, I wasn't sure, but it seemed important that I check inside. Brian told me something the night before he disappeared. He said there was a monster in his closet. I stopped dead in my tracks. And most children of 11 years old had grown out of seeing monsters in the shadows, hadn't they? At least my son had. He had grown out of that phase a long time ago she said, as if reading my thoughts. But then, all of a sudden, that night, he told me there was a monster hiding in his closet, and he... You what? He actually wet the bed. He hadn't done that in a long time. I see. And so he came out here, he told you all that, and then what happened? I went back to his room with him right away. I turned the lights on, I opened the closet to show him there was nothing inside, just his clothes and a few old shoes, but he still wasn't convinced. He said the monster was very good at hiding, that it pretends to be shadows. Glancing back in the open closet door again, I started moving towards it once more, this time with my legs feeling more wobbly like jello. He washed up and I changed his sheets and he went back to bed. Brian wanted to stay up with me and watch television after that. He, he didn't want to go back to his room, but I... I made him go. What time was this around? Two o'clock in the morning. And then he had to get up for school the next day. She said, then broke off sobbing once again. Opening the closet door, I peered inside. The darkness permeated the whole space like a thick oily cloud of smoke. Far more black and terrifying than it should have been, as if the darkness were a living thing camouflaging itself there, pretending to be just a closet, just... just like the missing boy had claimed. I shook my head, trying to clear these thoughts from my mind, but they persisted. Can you turn the light on any brighter than that? No, it's all the way up. Stupid light bulbs seem to get dimmer every day, even after I replaced it. I have to get an electrician over here one of these days. I pulled out my flashlight. I shone it into the dark space. The oily blackness retreated almost reluctantly, as if in a delayed reaction that shouldn't have been possible. I blinked my eyes twice, trying to decide if I was seeing things. My heart was suddenly hammering, and the palms of my hands were sweaty as I stared at the darkened space in the dim beam of my flashlight. It seemed to be malfunctioning, weak compared to its usual strength. I smacked it a few times and tried to remember when I'd last replaced the batteries. Can you feel that too? She asked from behind me nervously. I wanted to turn around and look at her, but was afraid to leave my back exposed to the darkness. I know it's crazy, but ever since that night, I can't help but feel like maybe he was right. Can you feel it? Something staring at you? 
She let out a nervous titter, which broke me out of my stunned silence. No, ma'am, I lied. Just looks like a regular bedroom closet to me. You feel like there's something in there looking at you? Not just me, at us. It's watching both of us. It's seeing your face, Agent Barnes. I don't think that's a good thing. What? How come you don't want to turn your back on it, Agent Barnes? You do feel it. I know you do. Close the door so it can't stare at us anymore, will you? I don't like that feeling. Not one bit. I pushed it with a shaking hand and felt the satisfying click of it closing. Suddenly, I could breathe again. We both left the room in a hurry and I excused myself momentarily into the bathroom. I looked at my reflection in the mirror and didn't recognize my own face staring back. There were bags beneath my eyes that hadn't been there before and my skin, my skin looked yellow gray, sallow and jaundiced. I felt sick to my stomach. Before I could do anything, the nausea overcame me. Getting down on my knees, I retched into the toilet bowl. Pure black bile like molasses poured out of me, sticky and tenacious like tar. It burned like acid as it came up from my stomach, coating my tongue afterwards and tasting oily and terrible. I rinsed up my mouth and flushed the toilet again and again to no avail. I stumbled out of the bedroom, drunk feeling and dizzy, but still wanting to finish my interview. I needed to at least try. She was waiting for me in the kitchen, standing by the sink. I stumbled into the room and I felt it spinning all around me, clutching my head with both hands. I tried to force myself to see straight. Uh, just a couple more questions, I said, covering my mouth so that she didn't see the black bile coating my tongue. My heart was pounding far too quickly and I tried to ignore the fact that something was potentially very seriously wrong with me, still completely in denial of it at that point. You don't look well, Agent Barnes. You look gray in the face. Are you all right? Fine. Fine. Now, can you tell me about Brian's father? I understand he passed away several years ago. Uh, did he have any family? Close friends? She shook her head at me, as if none of these questions mattered. And she was right. In a way, they didn't. The interview didn't lead anywhere, and I couldn't focus on anything that she said. Soon, I was blackout on the street again. The memory of the end of the interview gone entirely from my mind. It was like I had been on autopilot without realizing it, and I didn't... I didn't like that feeling, as if someone else had been driving the car and I had been asleep behind the wheel. I had a very strong suspicion that whatever had happened to Brian would not be a solvable crime. And if it was solvable, those findings would not be suitable for an official report. This had redacted written all over it, assuming it even made it up to the chain of command. If I told my superiors what I had just experienced, they wouldn't have believed a word of it. The case had gone cold months before, so I wasn't expected of me to solve it, only to try to lend a hand if I could. Most of the cases ended up remaining unsolved, so it wouldn't require much explanation if I wasn't able to do anything useful. I really didn't feel like I would be able to do anything useful. I had terrible brain fog for the rest of the trip getting contemptuous looks from the local police detectives whenever I suggested anything that I thought might be useful. Everything had been tried before by the sounds of it, and began to feel as if I had overstayed my welcome. My flight back home was a red eye. I tried to sleep through it. I found my dreams were plagued by nightmares. I kept dreaming I was a kid again, back in my childhood bedroom. Not only that, but my closet door kept squealing open in the night, creaking loudly the wood swinging back and forth as if blown by an impossible wind. I stood up on my child legs to go over to it, but found myself frozen with fear, staring at the blackness within the closet. That deep, penetrating darkness which seemed to spread like flooding, overflowing water towards me, and then, as I reached out a trembling hand for the door handle to close it, something else reached out and grabbed my wrist. An ice-cold, gnarled hand, rotten and emaciated. The flesh was pale and bluish purple, mottled and covered in wounds, seeping and oozing with blood and pus. As I tried desperately to pull away, fighting it with all of my strength, it pulled me deeper into the darkness. I fell in, plunging into the depths of it, 
suffocating in the dark abyss. And when I woke up, I was screaming, and the airplane had begun to descend. The flight attendants gave me a look which told me my terror was not appreciated. By the time I got home that night, it was already dark and well past Greg's bedtime. My wife was in bed, so I poured myself a drink, sat down on the couch to watch television for a little while, hoping to distract myself from the things I'd seen, and from the dreams I couldn't unsee. I wanted so badly to forget that dream, but it was the only thing I could visualize when I closed my eyes, that rotten corpse hand grabbing hold of my wrist and squeezing. I felt as if I could feel that pain even after I had awoken. That feeling of something tightening around my forearm like a freezing vice. I looked down at my arm to see a handprint there, slowly purple like an old bruise. It was fading like it was old, and yet... Yet I hadn't seen it earlier. The hell? What's happening to me, I asked myself, standing up and pacing. There was cold beer in the fridge. Despite the time I went in there, I grabbed the bottle, popped it open, chugged its contents. I felt so thirsty all of a sudden, like I hadn't drank in days, but I didn't want water. I, the thought of it disgusted me. The bottle was empty, and so I grabbed another and another, draining them both. Soon I was on my fourth, and then it was empty. The rest of the six-pack was gone two minutes later, and I belched loud enough to wake the dead after I finished polishing it off. Still thirsty, I went to the cupboard. I pulled out an old, dusty bottle of Gibson's. I drank it straight down, the usual burn of it absent now. Instead, it just felt like heat in my belly afterwards. Suddenly very tired, I stumbled off to bed, but not before peeking into Greg's room to check on him. It was around 3 a.m. by that point. He was fast asleep and snoring, and his closet door was closed tightly. I made sure of that. When we woke up the next morning, Greg was gone. I had locked all the doors and windows, and Greg didn't have his own key. He didn't have a cell phone we could trace either, but I got the feeling that it wouldn't make a difference either way. The police came to investigate and were surprised to hear what I do for a living. They were even more surprised to hear about the case I had just been investigating. Think it might be a copycat? One of the detectives asked innocently. If only it could have been simple. Or maybe the same guy. You might be right, I said, unable to deny their logic. But I knew that wasn't what had happened. Not really. Let's take a look around his room, they said. And I led them down the hallway towards Greg's room, showing them inside. I left it exactly how it was. We didn't touch anything. The closet door swung open an inch, then stopped. It opened an inch wider and stopped again. Does the closet door always do that? The taller detective asked. No. Why don't you take a look? At first I thought the shooting star would collide with the hill I was sitting on. Its trajectory, arcing earthward from an otherwise starless night sky, seemed destined for the great hill I found myself resting on late at night when I'm, as my friend would put it, stuck in my feelings. I was admittedly a bit sadder than usual, so the night concluded with my star scent obliteration. It wouldn't have necessarily been a terrible or surprising way to end it, but fortuitously, or maybe not, depending on how you see the story's end, the meteorite curved downward at the last moment, plummeting violently into the field below the hill and sending up a great plume of smoke and scattering bits of blackened earth in every direction. From my vantage at the top of the hill, I could clearly see the smoldering impact site and marveled at the proximity and scale of the destruction. I was rendered dumbstruck at how close I had come to simply being annihilated by the mere cosmic chance. Eventually, the smoke cleared somewhat, and I was able to get a look at exactly what had fallen from the heavens, and my previous relief at being spared a fiery death was ejected, wholly replaced by a mounting terror and fear of a new, previously unimagined demise. Within the black-rimmed crater, 
Stirring amidst the smoke and molten debris was a creature, a horror from some unmapped sector of the great abyssal gulf beyond Earth. Smoke cleared to reveal dark, leathery flesh wrapped tautly around a massive, grotesquely bulbous skull. The entire structure riddled with eyes or glazed orb-like projections resembling sight organs. Variable magma fell away from the body that was to my best see completely uninformed guess. Some genetic cross mixture between a scorpion and a salamander. Its body was a triply segmented trunk from which kicked and spasmed six reptilian limbs. The whole abominable thing was slick with a clear sparkling mucus as if newborn of some celestial womb. A tail jet black, undulant, and laterally spiked along the entirety of its length, flicked away what remained of the smoke, revealing the wholesome horribleness of the alien entity. The thing was massive, it would have dwarfed a school bus, and it was no surprise that it had survived atmospheric entry. The sheer bulk of its body, coupled with the obviously heat-resistant flesh, proved that it could sustain and withstand incredible damage. Shaking away what little disorientation it had suffered from its landfall, it rose from the still-burning crater, rearing itself almost elegantly into the moon-illuminated night. Perched upon the crater's rim, its frame whitely glided in the lunar glow. It reminded me of some angelic image I'd seen as a child above an altar at church, though there was plainly nothing angelic about its cosmically inhuman presence. Somehow, both awestruck and terrified, I sat petrified atop the hill, initially ignorant to the sudden cold that had arisen at the emergence of the ultra-terrestrial creature. Soon the crater beneath it cooled, the flames dying out with startling swiftness, and then the earth, once superheated by the kinetic destruction carried out against it, likewise cooled, and then froze. The volcanic rock hardened and frosting over in a matter of seconds. The creature, consciously or naturally, possessed some kind of cooling ability, emitted an invisible but incredibly powerful coolant from its alien pores. After a few moments of basking in the lunar light, it lowered itself onto the level, partially scorched ground beyond the crater, and, and despite the grace with which it carried out this simple maneuver, the earth shook with its landing. The lizard-like claws sank into the earth, but the creature, upon settling itself, found no difficulty in traversing the earth and soil. It quickly scuttled a few yards forward, directly towards the hill on which I sat. The sensory organs embedded in its hairless, globular head quickly found me, and at the recognition of my personhood in relation to the otherwise unpeopled environment, the creature began its ascent of the hill. This ascent amounted to little more than a small climb of its colossal frame, and upon submitting the hill, which had taken me about two full minutes to climb, it inclined its body forward so that it loomed imposingly over me, its form blotting out the moon and throwing a tenebrous shadow over the peak. The eyes nightmarishly fixated on me seemed to peer beyond my flesh, scrutinizing my very soul. And I felt my mind or spirit shrink inward, knowing that there was no hiding my physical body from the omni-eyed monstrosity. For a while, it simply stared, regarding me with an almost palpable misanthropy. And then, when I thought I'd lose my mind or bladder beneath this abyssal gaze, a slit in its head appeared, and a structure laterally opened the top half rising like the lid of a box, revealing an interior composed of pink, pulsating flesh and long, wriggling feelers, slick with a crimson slime. One of these feelers slowly emerged from the cephalic opening, and before I could comprehend its purpose, it shot towards me, leaving a blood-like trail through the air in its wake. Unable to react fast enough, I was struck in the face by the feeler, which felt like the tongue of some perpetually salivating dog. Despite having come from the thing's head, which would presumably be warm, the slime with which the feeler was coated was surprisingly cold. I shivered and wrapped my limbs around my body when the viscous stuff dripped onto me. 
I would have clambered away, not expecting to escape, but at least to distance myself from the loathsome feeler. But it had, upon contact, immobilized me. And I surmised that the slime's purpose was probably an aesthetic. I briefly feared that the appendage would then bore into my skull and suck out my brains. It wasn't an unreasonable fear given the circumstances. But even as it held firm to my forehead, I felt no sensations of penetration. My thoughts weren't suddenly clouded or diminished. Before and above me, the great horror did start to tremble a little. Something was clearly happening. And I tried to think of something to do, some way to appease or placate the alien before it finished whatever monstrous process it had begun. But then, without an actual prompting or pleading on my part, the feeler was abruptly retracted and freedom of movement returned to me. Rather than get up and run, I quickly went about rubbing my arms and legs, hoping to return some warmth to the nearly frozen limbs. The alien's trembling went on a little longer, and then, as abruptly as the feeler had been retracted, it stopped. It lowered itself a little so that its inordinate and ungodly head was level with the crest of the hill, with me. There was a smell which I hadn't initially noticed, perhaps due to the effect of my immense fear suddenly and violently seized me, rendering me almost totally incoherent. It was nauseating, miasmal, worse, I imagined, than the tomb-sealing funk of a thousand rotting corpses. I reeled back, blasted by wave after wave of the windswept fetter. But the alien, perhaps thinking I was trying to escape, emitted a low, earth-rattling growl from some unseen orifice amidst the eye-studded face. I stiffened in place, my repulsion overridden by new levels of terror. Apparently satisfied with my obedience, the alien straightened a little, and a few of its hateful, glaring eyes closed, making it appear somewhat relaxed. And then from the same unseen orifice, it spoke, emitting a voice not dissimilar in overall tone to the sonic chaos of a sunken ship buckling under the pressure of the deep. You... You will be the first upon whom I test my methods for the destruction of the human race. I, Siane, cold bleeder, have come to end the people of Earth before they can merge into a single mass of being as many of their biologic nature have done on other worlds. I have taken your language to give voice to your demise. These words augur the coming of the boreal death. I was understandably speechless. I hadn't thought for a moment that the thing would speak, wouldn't have guessed among all the terrible possibilities that its first action would be to scan my brain for the words needed to announce its mission. When it became obvious by its languidly blinking eyes that it awaited an answer, I regained a minuscule amount of composure and said, But why? It wasn't the best reply, and it had technically said why it had come, but I figured that it would understand the broader connotations of the word. Plus, I was still too shaken to offer anything more substantial. Your kind... Beings of mortal flesh all eventually coalesce into a single entity if they survive long enough. It is the ultimate goal of a species' evolution, the culmination, or rather, the elimination of its most vexing needs. Procreation and survival when all are one, there needn't be struggles over resources. Survival simply occurs effortlessly, and procreation is achieved seamlessly from within. Self-propagation. Self-fulfillment. Biological perfection. I cannot allow such perfection organic life as you know it is despicable, hideous, an affront to the sensibilities of beings beyond your ken. I am an outrider of the stars, 
emissary of the Nader dwellers, sent to annihilate those who dare become something greater. I wanted to laugh at a statement that humanity was hideous, considering its own ghastly appearance, but I knew that any insolence whatsoever would probably result in my agonizing end. And while it had already spoken of its intent to destroy all of humanity, I didn't want to be the first to go. Instead, I asked it why it was telling me this. Why it hadn't simply swept across the world, freezing everything in its wake, assuming that's how it planned to carry out the anthropocide. Despite the lack of anything resembling a mouth, not counting the tendril-filled facelet, which hadn't moved with its words, I got the impression it had briefly smiled at my comment before again speaking in its imploding metallic voice. Because, while I could easily render your species extinct from afar, I, on occasion, like to personally visit with a planet's doom-pronounced people. To learn what I can of them, I am also, among other things, a scholar. Feeling a little emboldened by the fact that I was having a conversation with a literal alien, I promptly responded, Well, what did you learn from me? The slit in the face opened a little more and I saw the scarlet tendrils therein writhe chaotically and in excitement at the upcoming revelation. I learned that more than any other, your species is emotionally dependent upon companionship. You crave it, thrive on it, and are pitifully lost without it. Just then, before I could offer anything in the way of a response, the gigantic head spat forth a great glob of crimson slime, coating the crown of the hill. I scrambled back, unsure of what effects it might have on my skin, but stopped my retreat prematurely, lest it be misinterpreted as a full-on flight from the area. I didn't want to be shot in the back by some caustic projectile or whipped clean in half by a tendril. The red sludge bubbled a little on the ground, then incredibly began to take shape. Rising from the earth with a sickening autonomy, I watched. Again, rendered speechless and immobile, but this time by the sheer dreadful spectacle of it, as the figure of a woman soon took form. First featureless, and then developing the aspects and finer physical minutia of a twenty-something-year-old female. After only a few moments, a fully grown woman stood before me, auburn hair falling loosely over her shoulders, amber eyes sparkling beautifully to spontaneous, sentient life, and then darting nervously around the area, arms crossed clumsily to shield her well-formed nakedness from the fear-stricken man standing awkwardly before her. Recognition came at once, and I let out a sort of stuttered half-chuckle, in complete disbelief of the situation. I mean, satisfied by my reaction, the alien let out some grating approximation of a laugh, and then before she could even turn to see from where the harsh sound came from, sent out its tendrils and seized the paradoxically newborn woman around the waist, speaking even as it held the woman aloft in its tongue-like appendage it mocked. And I've learned that seeing the ones you cherish die is perhaps the most awful pain of all, that the resultant trauma can, in most extreme cases, Drive the bereaved to take their own life. Yes, for Earth, I plan to inflict this particularly acute form of psychological pain upon billions at once, to see just how many I can drive to their own end, before I blast the planet to a state of utter frigid lifelessness with my ultra-terrene cold. Cruelly, Malevolently, it shook the ensnared woman, who, having no idea what was going on, screamed with a mounting hysteria. Now, witness the end of your world as you know it. Without mercy, in an act of ultimate obscenity, it pulled apart the woman mid-scream, sending limbs and organs and blood raining haphazardly onto the surface of a hill. 
and the gruesome show had concluded, and there was nothing left but two limply sagging scraps of flesh that tossed the nearly bloodless remains away, leaving the hill-scattered remains the only evidence that a woman had briefly existed. The gore screamed, and my heart sank at the intensity of the accompanying smell. It, it rivaled in awfulness. The sepulchral stench that had arisen had taken hold of my senses at the arrival of the Starfiend. I was, of course, appalled. I was disgusted, repulsed by the merciless display of ultraviolence. But I was not grief-stricken. The woman's death hadn't hurt me on a personal level. Because the woman wasn't real. And I don't just mean the fact that she had been born of the alien slime, but the woman had never been real. That she was a fictional character, one I have since adolescence loved as much as a guy could love a fictional character. Somehow the creature wasn't aware of this, despite having probed the very depths of my mind. When I didn't break out into tears or lament the woman's death, the creature trembled a little and a few of its closed eyes opened, as if to try and detect some subtler suggestion of the missing grief it had been expecting. Hmm. Why do you not cry and mourn for the dead woman? You just watched your beloved be viciously ripped apart. Its voice, while still discomforting, faltered a little, a small measure of uncertainty detectable in its otherwise callous remark. I sat quietly for a moment, thinking of how best to respond, how best to explain why I seemed so inhumanly sociopathic regarding the butchering of the helpless woman. Do you know why I've been sitting on this hill? The creature's eyes blinked in an unsettling unison, which I took as its version of shaking its head no. Because I'm lonely. I'm lonely because I don't have a girlfriend, a, a companion. That woman you so disgustingly conjured and mutilated wasn't a real person. She's a fictional character from a video game. Do you know, do you know what that is? Do you understand why I wouldn't necessarily be grief stricken by her death? It was a cruel, terrible thing to do, sure. But that thing, that image, wasn't anyone I ever truly knew. The creature's eyes then all started blinking sporadically while the air-embedded tendrils went rigid and dry, falling from the orifice to hang limply beneath its chin like a blood-soaked beard. For a moment, it looked as if it was suffering from some kind of palsy or catalepsy, the body alternating between states of extreme physical unrest and statuesque rigidity. The psychological chaos went on for quite some time, and I considered finally taking the opportunity to run away but an inkling of smugness kept me rooted in place. I wanted to see if the thing would die. If I had, with any apathy, induced in it some kind of lethal shock or seizure. But to my dismay, its bodily turbulence eventually subsided. The alien almost immediately regained its former deathly composure, speaking in its normal, terrible timber. It said, Well... That is quite pathetic, even a little unnerving. The love you harbor for that character is profound, real, stronger than most bonds I felt between the most synchronous partners of other sapien species. You even acknowledge the pointlessness of it, the unreality of her being, and yet, you still persist in these feelings. Surely, you must be some kind of human anomaly, some emotional degenerate, a religiously profane and socially hated outcast. You must be alone in this kind of wretched behavior. My smugness flickered out, and in its place a sadness, bordering on despair, flared within. Raising my head to meet the eyes of the alien, I responded, You'd be surprised how many of us feel this way. How many of us has resorted to loving, unreal, inanimate things, either because we are, as you said, degenerates, or, in one way or another, because we don't think we deserve love. 
Others simply can't hold on to it, or resort to desperate means to filling that nagging need. I'm not surprised the apex form of an organic species is a singular, collective entity. I mean, loneliness is a bitch, man. The alien's eyes blinked languidly for a few moments. The implied expression inscrutable to my tired mind. Then, presumably making up its mind after a moment of contemplation, it reared back, again presenting itself in an almost regal, majestic fashion, beautifully framed in the radiant moonlight. It retracted its feelers, closed its head, and spoke one final time. I do not think I will end this world. Well, not today. If even a few of you are like that, so wretchedly lonely and convinced of being terminally unlovable, then I do not think I need to worry about your species forming a great and dangerous collective. You are a depressing people. That much is apparent. There are other species in the far reaches of this galaxy who show greater potential for annihilation, who are more worthy of the implicable frost. Goodbye, human. And I suppose. Good luck. Rising from the ground through some means of telekinetic levitation, it then turned skyward and flew away, leaving me alone atop the hill with the cooling remains. After 30 minutes of listening to the man's charcoal-scented ramblings, my notepad was sparse with information. Oven, gasoline, the egghead. The burnt man's frenzied babblings didn't give me much to go on in terms of how the fire actually started, but there wasn't any doubt over who was responsible for it. Jason Blomquist was rushed to the emergency care with third-degree burns before the blaze even in his living room had gone out. He had no prior convictions, but his father, a certain Alfred Blomquist, had spent the past two decades in a psychiatric ward up north for trying to paint his family house with gasoline. I've served in the arson department for long enough to know that the need to start fires usually singes through the family tree. Blomquist was thoroughly burnt and handcuffed to his hospital bed. His ravings didn't shed any light on the actual mechanics of the blaze, but they would serve as an easy home run for any prosecutors straight out of law school. I thanked Blomquist for his time and made my way through the sickly-smelling hallways to the parking lot. Beyond the shelter of the hospital, it was storming. It was the type of downpour that could slow down, perhaps even put out a barn fire. For a couple minutes, I stood under the plastic roof and eyed the quickest route over to my car. As I made my calculations, an old man in a bathrobe and a walker made his way out of the hospital. The old guy looked frail enough to have seen the steam engine get invented, but he dragged his walker with a sort of regal authority. He shuffled his way over to the no-smoking sign, defiantly glanced at it, and produced a crumpled-up cigarillo out of his bathrobe. I took out a cigarette and joined the old-timer for some idle chit-chat. His cigarillo reeked with a horrible mix of vanilla and burnt hospital food. When he shuffled his way back inside of the hospital, I told him I'd see him around. Not likely, he rasped, just before the doors slid shut. The sprint to my car left me soaked and out of breath. Finding a steady drip of water on the case files I left on the seat didn't make me feel any better. I dug some scotch tape out of the glove box and added it to the collage of black X's on my car's roof. The rain had turned my notes into inky hieroglyphics, but the rest of the pages managed to stay intact. I had a nip, lit up another cigarette, and tried to remember what I had thought worthy of writing down. It was the sort of arson case that made an argument for a merciful god with a cruel sense of humor. Jason Blomquist, age 35, recently divorced, has a son, Kennedy Blomquist, age 6, over for the weekend. In the middle of the night, following his pop's footsteps, Jason sets a fire on the ground floor. Jason manages to get himself pretty burnt up, and the blaze consumes most of the living room by the time that the troops can contain it. But the house stays stable, and the second floor is completely untouched. The upstairs bedrooms aren't even singed. And what's more, little Kennedy is found sleeping in his bed, completely unaware of anything happening. There was an interview transcript of the kid in my morning notes. Didn't seem to be completely aware of what had happened. 
But when pressed on his father's behavior, he says that his pops was angry at him the evening before the blaze. Apparently, little Kennedy had watched something on his iPad that he shouldn't have, and that set his dad off. Combined with Jason Blomquist's strange ramblings in the hospital, the case seemed pretty clear. Blomquist lost his marbles and decided to set his house on fire. Now my job was to figure out how he set his house on fire. I had another nip and thought about Blomquist's kid for a bit. Another cigarette. Did not make the rain slow down. The water started dripping back down on my passenger seat. I emptied my ashtray out of the window and rode off to the station for the mutt. She was smart, if you're the sort of person who considers dogs capable of intelligence. Marilyn was a bright-eyed golden lab, one year into her five-year sentence. I've been on the force for a while. She was my fourth canine. I knew not to get too attached. These dogs were destined to solve crime till their senses dulled, and then they retire to become someone's fun rescue dinner fact. It only takes them a couple of years to forget their handler. She managed to get paw marks all over my notes when she got in the car, but the fact that they were barely legible calmed my nerves somewhat. Once Marilyn had managed to get herself comfortable, she opened her mouth and excitedly panted at the world outside. It was as if the freezing downpour beyond the windshield didn't exist for her. That mutt could retain her excitement in a meteor shower. My windshield wiper struggled on the freeway, and the inside of my car was getting unmanageably wet. Yet by the time we hit the repeating spiderweb of cul-de-sacs, the sun sheepishly peeked out from the sky. Marilyn shoved her nose through my cracked window and hoffed to the outside air. She was better at getting me to the crime scene than my busted GPS. I don't like suburbia. There's no personality in those homeowner association dictated houses. You can see life flowing through city streets. There's character in the offbeat storefronts and clumps of people who hang around them. People live in the city. Suburbs? It's just a place where people come to sleep and if the market isn't crashing to save up enough cash to escape somewhere tropical. The suburbs are also the place where my canines retire. When we climbed out of the car, a woman with a helmet-like haircut noticed us. She insisted on letting her snotty child pet Marilyn. When I told her that the mutt was working and shouldn't be bothered, the helmet-headed woman grew disappointingly angry and started recording me on her phone. As me and Marilyn entered the crime scene, we hear the crazy woman yelling something about civil service as her child wept in confusion. The troops were quick to contain the fire, but with suburban property prices this high, they usually are. The city's second finest had managed to contain the blaze halfway through the living room. A half-melted iPad with a screen smashed in delineated the exact extent of the fire. Everything beyond it, reaching out towards the kitchen, was charred history. The house had been cleared out early in the morning, but the hallway still seemed warm. Any hint of fresh air and manicured lawns crept away, and the air was replaced by the familiar stench of work. Marilyn stopped panting and lowered her snout. She breathed in that symphony of smells her ancestors were bred for, took a couple more sniffs for safety, and then sat down. She looked up at me like a hungry red-light window model. Marilyn was loose for treats. They all are. If you're holding something to eat, you're a dog's best friend. If your hands are empty, you're about as interesting as the next person who walks by holding a burger. Affection doesn't come for free, and neither does arson investigation. I reached into the treat bag and pulled out a grease-smelling cookie shaped like a cartoon bone. She ate her reward in one bite and immediately proceeded to work for another one. Marilyn huffed in the fumes from the black floor and dragged me down the burnt-down hallway. By the time we were in the kitchen, I didn't need an arson dog to show me where the fire started. I smelled it myself. I said, could have solved this one on my own. But I still gave her a treat. The kitchen had the obvious wear and tear of a house fire, but the oven seemed to have come out of a wholly different disaster. The metal was bent and jagged, clearly pointing towards an explosion. Blomquist had shoved something covered in accelerant into the oven and decided to cook it. Case solved. I asked, anything else of note, Marilyn? She studied my face for a moment, as if I was speaking an alien language. Then her big brown eyes jumped down to the treat bag. She stared at the food like a jonesing drunk and then sniffed at the air. With a tug on the leash, she let me know that her nose might pick up another trail, granted that I had the grub to back it up. Marilyn led me to the garage. 
even before the fire, Blomquist's car must have driven circles around his property value. The ride was new and screamed midlife crisis. Off in the corner sat a bunch of workout equipment still in its box. Marilyn sniffed it without much enthusiasm. She wasn't interested in how Jason Blomquist was dealing with his divorce. She was interested in the dusty shelf on the far side of the garage. Most of the space was taken up by unused tools and electronics that were too useless to keep, but too expensive to throw away. Yet among the forgotten items, there was something bright and baby blue. A bowl. I pointed at the bowl. You want me to look at that? Marilyn's jowls grew wet. I fed her a treat that was shaped like a hydrant. The bowl was covered with what seemed to be old tablecloth. For a second, I thought that the mud had showed me to Blomquist's experiment with self-rising dough, but the moment I removed the covering, I knew she found another lead. The bowl smelled like a gas station in the sticks. Inside the bowl sat an egg-shaped mess of ground beef and flour. The egghead, I thought. I disregarded most of Blomquist's hospital bed ravings as actual insanity, or at least a precursor to an insanity plea. In between the sips of water that the nurse administered Blomquist kept on rasping about having to create the egghead and doing it all for science. It all seemed like gibberish at the time, but looking down at the egg-shaped sculpture, I wish I had recorded the interview. The craftsmanship of the egg was bizarre. The body was rough and covered in loose chunks and strands of meat. The eyes of the figure were nothing but deep thumb indentations, yet the stubby limbs of the egghead looked as if they were made out of marble. Every finger existed in its own grayish, reddish right. The bottom of the shoes were flat enough to stand on. As I examined the hunk of gasoline-soaked meat, I noticed that the teeth of the egghead were also threateningly detailed. I had a nip, and then I draped the cloth back over the baby blue bowl. The smell of accelerants were making my head throb, so I cracked open the back door and let in some air. Beyond the door, there was a fence, and beyond that fence, there was a gravel path towards a nature trail. A gentle drizzle returned, but it was muffled under the bubbling of a nearby stream. The fresh air had cleared my head. My lungs weren't satisfied with inhaling the smell of fresh-cut grass. I knocked a cigarette out of the pack and almost put it in my mouth before I realized where I was. I forced the smoke back into its box and elected to take the plastic bowl back to the station. While I managed to control my urges, however, the mutt did not. The wheeze escaped my lips before I had a chance to properly grip the leash. Shit! By the time my lips pursed for the sh... Marilyn was sprinting through the backyard. She jumped the fence with the ease of a track horse and slammed her front paws on a tree. Up in the branches, where its fur slick with rain, sat a hyperventilating squirrel. Marilyn's sole purpose for existing boiled down to terrifying the tiny creature. I called. I wiggled the bag of treats. I called again. Nothing helped. The only thing that these mutts like more than food is chasing vermin. I walked out of the garage... I lit up a cigarette and made my way across the fence in a dignified a manner as I could. By the time I got to the tree, Marilyn's hunter instincts had evaporated and all that was left was shame. She kept her head low and stared up at me with a guilt that revealed the whites of her eyes. It's all right. We all have demons to fight, I said, then grabbed the leash. I wanted to get out of the rain and back to the station. Whatever I had witnessed in the garage would be easier to process after a cup of coffee. I tugged, but she didn't move. Marilyn was too busy sniffing the air. I tried puffing on my soaked cigarette, but came up smokeless. I stubbed out the cigarette on the gravel and pulled on the leash again. Come on, Marilyn. Let's get you back in the station. Marilyn didn't want to go to the station. She kept her nose to the gravel. Then she pulled. I took out a treat to see whether she was serious, but Marilyn didn't even eye the bag. She pulled again. She was on the trail. She led me towards the bubbling of a stream and an old wooden bridge. Walking through the nature trail, I found myself worrying that Marilyn had simply caught the scent of maybe another squirrel. But the moment I saw the bridge, I knew she had something. Pressed into the aging wood, there were footsteps. Burnt black into the bridge as if made by a small, perfectly spherical shoe. There were footsteps. 
the egghead, I thought. My hands reflectively brushed up against my holster. I didn't know what to point the gun at, I just wanted to make sure that it was there. I felt way in over my head. Past the bridge, the waddling footsteps disappeared into the muddy path. When the black tracks disappeared, Marilyn slowed down, but she still had a direction. As we stomped through the mud, her pull lessened. Whatever tracks she had been following had grown faint. Marilyn was still after something, but, but her steps lost their confidence. Not knowing what to make of the situation, I let the mud drag me around while I figured out what to do. The wind had picked up and brought the rain down in gentle waves. I let the droplets wash over my tired face and tried to clear my mind by listening to the stream. At first, my thoughts kept on drifting to that chunk of sculpted meat soaked in gasoline. But with some calm breaths and a quick nip, I managed to get my head screwed on straight. I listened to the bubbling stream and Marilyn sniffing, and the falling rain and their far-off traffic. The strange hissing sound like someone throwing water on a hot stove. It came from beneath the old bridge. By the time I was certain of the strange sound, Marilyn had completely lost the trail. I gave her another bone-shaped cookie for a good effort and then beckoned her towards the bridge. She sniffed at the air again, caught something beyond my comprehension, and took the lead herself. With each gust of rain, the hissing sound grew louder. As Marilyn dragged me off the dirt path, I started to hear something else. Beneath the strange hiss, a voice lingered and babbled in a gentle falsetto. Marilyn growled. She saw him before I did. When my eyes finally came across the egg-shaped creature, I mumbled a prayer. I drew my gun. His body was of grayish flesh, not unlike the egghead I found in the garage. Each droplet that hit the creature's meaty body, however, turned to steam. Wherever the rain hit the flesh simmered up with foamy white and left a mark. The creature sat beneath the bridge, but the wind was strong enough to curve the droplets. The creature didn't seem to mind. He just babbled to himself with his sharp little teeth. He just babbled to himself and watched me. Unlike the work in progress I found in the garage, this egghead had eyes. Big red-hot coals rested in the creature's sockets. The egghead's gaze sizzled as it noticed me. He stopped babbling and he got up and he waddled his way towards me. I dropped the leash and I grabbed the gun proper and yelled at the egg to stop moving. He didn't listen. Instead, the creature raised his stubby arms towards me. He smelled like sulfur. He smelled like, like sulfur and those short, fat fingers were stretching out towards me like marble worms slathered in grease. The egghead's fingers slid towards me. One bark from my pistol made him retreat. I blew a hole right down his forehead, and he fell over. An overpowering stench of rotten eggs took control of the air. The thing was oozing a yolky, greenish fluid out of its wounds. One of the egghead's fiery eyes, being dislodged by my bullet, lay a stone's throw away from the corpse. When the viscous green liquid reached the hot coal, it coagulated into what looked like scrambled eggs. No, Marilyn, there's nothing good here for you. I barely got a hold of the leash to keep her from investigating. She refused any verbal orders to sit. It wasn't until I threw her a treat that I got her attention. Needing some space, I slipped the leash off and threw a handful of biscuits into the grass. Marilyn quickly occupied herself hunting. My hands were shaking. I instinctively reached into my jacket for a nip, but I realized the possible problems of having alcohol to my breath while trying to explain this egg man. I lit up a cigarette and I picked up my phone instead. Calling the station seemed like the most reasonable thing to do. Somebody else needed to see what I was seeing. As the phone rang, I started to worry whether I wasn't getting myself sent to an asylum for telling the chief what I saw. But then a wholly different concern occupied my thoughts. A babbling. The egghead was babbling again. Before I even reached for my gun, the terrifying thing was back on its feet. Before I even managed to aim, it had me down in the mud. The egghead didn't waddle this time, instead launching itself with shocking force straight into my solar plexus. The creature was the size of a football, but it packed the punch of an artillery fire. 
I felt my ribs crack. My breath left my lungs like a stampede at a theater fire. The egghead straddled my chest with such weight that my panicking heart strained. The creature's right eye socket had been reduced to a circle of what looked like burnt meat and pus, but its left eye, its left eye burnt with fiery rage. The babbling had gotten louder and sterner as if the small egghead was to teach me a lesson. His stubby fingers turned long once more. With a strange gentleness, they slithered down to my collarbone. I couldn't breathe and the egghead was tickling me. At first, the eggshell-covered fingers simply grazed against my neck, but soon, soon enough, the strange sensation turned painful. The thin fingers were growing increasingly hot. I could smell my stubble being singed. With my lungs compressed and hot irons at my vocal cords, I couldn't manage anything but a yelp. A yelp, luckily, was all that the girl needed. With a growl I'd never heard before, Marilyn knocked the egghead off my chest. She barked at the fumbling creature with the intensity of a shotgun and then leapt at it once more. Marilyn's second contact with the creature, however, was met with a sharp whimper. She sunk her teeth into the creature but immediately let go. A puff of smoke came out of the dog's mouth and the oval creature went crashing into the stream. The egghead met the water with the sputtering of a sauna rock. The water was starting to turn muddy with the rain. But I could see the creature clearly. Its flesh had turned the pale white of an eggshell, and the coal eye sprung bubbles like a hangover tablet. But the thing was still alive. I stomped at the monster. I stomped at the egghead until all that was left was coagulating clumps of greenish goo flowing down the stream. I made sure the egghead had been taken care of. And then I climbed out of the water to check up on the dog. She wasn't doing well. I didn't leave anything out of the report. The manila envelope I dropped at the chief's desk had the look of an overzealous sandwich. I described the egghead in detail. I included sketches and theories and even some photographs of what remained of the terror before the spring carried it away. Didn't do any help. The rest of the station was reluctant to believe what I had to say, but I had given some leeway to focus on the Blomquist fire investigation. A second interview with the burnt man didn't reveal anything new. All Jason Blomquist did was nonsensical blabber about the egghead again and speak about the importance of science. After a train ride up north, I managed to flag down Blomquist's ex-wife for a cup of coffee. But the conversation was fruitless as well. Aside from the couple mentions of his father's internment, Jason Blomquist never spoke about arson, let alone showed any signs or any tendencies towards it. I wanted to sit down with the kid, Kenny. Shed any light on the fire, but his mother refused to let me interview him. I could have nudged someone at the station to make the interview mandatory, but I didn't. Forcing the kid to talk to me wouldn't make the nightmares of the egg-shaped creature disappear. Wouldn't bring Marilyn's sense of smell back. For a while, I fought the idea. But eventually, I let all the thoughts of the Eggman die in the muddy stream of the cracked shell. Now, she had burnt her gums, and would have to be careful about solid foods for the rest of her life, but it was her nose that had really been given the death sentence. Marilyn's sense of smell would never, never come back. The creature that the mud had rendered herself, the vet had figured it out within a couple of minutes of the visit. In an effort to save me from the insane creature, the mud had rendered herself unemployable. I couldn't adopt her. Arson dogs don't belong in cramped city apartments. What I did manage to do, however, was pull some strings and shoot down some adoption requests. After calling in a couple of favors with the pen pushers, Marilyn managed to get adopted by my nephew out east. I have to drive half the country to get to her. But after the winter holidays, once all the fireworks have been set off and it's too cold for the forest fires. I, I see her. I see her, and, and she remembers me. So if you can see ghosts, I asked the woman, shellacking my nails, why are you doing this for a living? 
You try, lady. Put out an ad, see what you get. Susan, my manicure, snorted. I tried, and I got three calls. A family of seven who tried to baptize me. A schizo who tried to stab me with a needle. And the guy in the hotel room... Well, what he had under his bathrobe might have been pretty much invisible, but it didn't make it a ghost. See you in three weeks, I asked when she finished. <laughs> Don't think so, Susan wrinkled her nose. No offense, but you've got the stink of death about you. She hesitated. Either that or Tiffany microwaved fish for lunch again. I thought things would get better after a dead guy made my mobster husband disappear and I moved to the Midwest with my son, Ralphie Jr. I can't specify the place, but it's a town with a dying mall where unhappily married couples go to sip half-priced cocktails at Applebee's. And the hottest action on a Saturday night is cruising the Walmart parking lot with the radio blaring and the windows down. If you think that narrows it down, well, good luck. Right, Ralphie Jr. He's had some um, trouble adjusting to school. And it's no wonder you drop one F-bomb around here and people act like you just took a shit in their Wonder Bread and mayonnaise sandwich or something. I mean, the closest thing to an international community is one guy from Paris. Paris, Kentucky. What was I saying? Right, Ralphie Jr. The school. Now, Ralphie Jr. getting picked on is nothing new, you know? Kids can be so cruel, so petty, so prejudiced. And believe me, my little Ralphie deserves every bit of it. Last time I got called for a parent conference was because a kid was picking on Ralphie. It turned out that the kid hit Ralphie Jr. because my sweet little boy took his sandwich at lunch. Every day. For a year. I would have hit him too. What worries me is that Ralphie has made a friend, Ryan. Ralphie Jr. won't shut up about him. Ryan's amazing at hide-and-seek. It's like he disappears. You should have seen how high Ryan jumped today at recess. Nobody picks on me when I hang out with Ryan. The way Ralphie Jr. was talking, I was imagining this Ryan kid to be, I don't know, some kind of miniature Hulk picking Ralphie Jr. up from school a few days ago. I got a glimpse of him. Ryan looked as thin and weak as a gas station coffee. One of those smudge-faced puffy-eyed, pale kids who sits in the back and never says anything. He was carrying a scuffed-up teddy bear beneath one arm. Okay, so that was weird. But not as weird as our conversation in the car. The substitute fell and broke her ankle today, Ralphie Jr. explained, cheerfully, as though nothing could have pleased him more. She shouldn't have told Ryan to put away his teddy bear. I guess she didn't know. Didn't know what, I wondered. Did I get my mouth shut? Because I knew that Ralphie Jr., just like his dearly departed father, would spill all those secrets that he was trying so hard to keep if I just stayed quiet and let him do it. I was thinking, Ralphie Jr. began, in the same trying not to be nonchalant tone my dead husband used to put on just before asking me if he could use my credit card to put a down payment on a boat or some other sketchy thing. Do you think I could go over to Ryan's house sometime? Like, today, maybe? The apple didn't fall far from the shit for Brain's tree, it seemed. I groaned and I asked him for the address. Truth was, I wanted to meet this Ryan kid's parents, partially to see if they were psychos and partially to see if that bland little boy happened to have a hot, rich, single dad. If our kids already got along, that was a start, right? Well, I was still daydreaming about this Midwestern surfer millionaire dad when we pulled into Ryan's driveway. Early 2000s brick ranch house, no lights in the windows. The yard was a little small, but I cared more about the master bedroom closet space anyway. Walking up the driveway, holding Ralphie Jr.'s hand, I wondered if Ryan's dad and I would like the same wines. We rang the bell. Twice. No answer. I guess your friend isn't home, I sighed. And his dad isn't either. But as I loosened my grip on Ralphie Jr.'s hand and turned to check on the car... Something happened that chilled my blood. The door of the house flew open and Ralphie Jr.'s fingers slipped through mine. By the time I spun back around, it was like the house had swallowed him up. Hey! I pounded on the locked door. Hey! Rafael Palumbo Jr., you open this door right now, mister! Ryan, are you in there? Anybody? Hey! Mother's instinct, I guess, but the thought of what might be happening to my son inside that dark, silent house was driving me crazy. I bruised my shoulder, slamming all of my 125 pounds against the door again and again. Maybe only a few minutes had passed, but it felt like hours. I looked around for something to smash a window with. Mommy? Ralphie Jr. asked when I turned around again. Why are you holding a tree stump? 
It was a long ride home. Apparently, Ralphie Jr. informed me, Ryan couldn't play after all. But at least he'd given Ralphie Jr. what he came for. And that's where I noticed it. A teddy bear. A gray, one-eyed thing with a perpetual frown stitched onto its muzzle like a sick love child of Eeyore and Winnie the Pooh. I wondered if it had bed bugs. Oh, that's... nice. I was at a loss for words. So nice, I'm sure Ryan misses it a lot. We better take it right back, hon. We can't, Buffy explained, in a flat, terrified tone that I'd never heard him use before, not even when he was looking at an actual dead guy. Ryan says I have to take Chip for a little while, and I don't want to make Ryan mad. Chip. <laughs> at first the name made me roll my eyes, but then it made me wonder. There was a bit of bead missing from the top of Chip's single eye giving the gray bear a perpetual, hateful, downturned look. My son was staring into that broken eye like it was a peephole to the darkness beyond the stars or something like that. He took the bear to his room the moment he got home. Probably should have followed him, but dinner wasn't made and the dirty clothes were stacked high enough to be an OSHA violation. What can I say? When you've got nothing to wear to work tomorrow, the laundry takes priority over diabolical stuffed animals. Ralphie Jr.'s room was dark, door half open when I finally checked on him upstairs. Honey, I shouted. I cut the crusts off your pepperoni sandwiches. Something dribbled on my cheek. I looked up. Ralphie Jr. was dragging himself along the ceiling with his head turned around almost backwards. The teddy bear was clenched in his drooling jaws. I was too terrified to move, but when I opened my mouth, it was my mother voice that came out instead of a scream. Raphael Palumbo Jr., you come down from there this instant. My son did as he was told, but not in the way I imagined. I knew Ralphie Jr. was overweight. I didn't fully understand how bad it had gotten until he dropped onto my head. While Ralphie Jr. gurgled in the language of hell and tried to pull out my eyeballs, I tugged at the teddy bear between his teeth. It was clearly the cause of all this. What had made Ryan jump high and hide so well, when it finally came free, Ralphie Jr. collapsed in an exhausted heap. You're going in the blender, you little shit. I screamed at the bear in a cocktail of rage and fear. It didn't like that at all. Something rippled like flexing muscles beneath the cloth, and the stuffed arm I was holding onto got hot. Hot enough to burn. I yelped and dropped the flaming teddy bear, which crawled around, setting fire to my landlady's carpet. I wondered if this would be covered under my right to bear firearms. I grabbed one of my dead husband's golf clubs and gave chase, but that tiny bastard was fast for his size. A hateful blue glow full of evil intelligence radiated from Chip's single eye, and with a wave of its paw, a dresser flew across the room and nearly smashed my head like a melon. Next thing I knew, I was swinging the golf club like a maniac. Playing baseball with my Ikea furniture, I rolled Ralphie Jr. out of the way, ducked beneath a flying desk lamp, and gave that little fucker a hole-in-one straight to the jaw. Four, I yelled as the possessed bear flew backwards into the hall closet. I jammed what was left of my coffee table under the closet door, which had started to vibrate with telekinetic force. A blue glow came from inside. Ralphie Jr. was unconscious, but at least he was breathing. I had no idea what to do, so I looked at my phone. And I thought of Andre. My dead mobster husband, Ralph, had kept all his drug dealer contacts in code in the little black book, which I held on to for some reason. Andre had been a part of that world. Was it possible that his number might still be inside? I wasn't worried about the code. Ralph had thought that it was clever, but I cracked it halfway through an episode of Desperate Housewives years ago. That was how I'd been able to send sympathy cards to all his mistresses. It took some finding, and the pounding and smoke from upstairs was really annoying. But before long, I was dialing, and someone picked up. I kept waiting to hear breathing on the other end of the line, but then I remembered that Andre didn't breathe. Andre, I asked, trying to sound sweet, do you remember me? There was no reply, but the sound of my heartbeat, and then... Yeah. I wondered what I should say. Something like, wow, you sound great. It's like you've barely rotted at all. I decided the truth was the best way to go. I've got a possessed stuffed animal. Do you know anybody who might be interested in something like that? A very long pause. Where is the trapped one? The violent, raspy shift in Andre's voice almost made me drop the phone. Uh, 
in my house. Get out. Then send me the address. We just moved here, I whined. The buyer will compensate you. Andre named a figure. And I decided I didn't like living in a giant cornfield that much after all. What else can I say? Looks like Ralphie Jr. and I are on the road again. I know I'm not the only one that's had this happen to him. I can't be. I'm sure at least some of you know what I'm talking about. That moment that they hit and you realize something's off. The moment you realize it's not just a bad trip. It's a... It's what you took has gone bad. You know, like... It's expired antibiotics or Tylenol. For most of my adult life, I did little more than smoke weed. With the occasional evening where I could find some sort of hallucinogen. You know, acid was my preference. But I wouldn't shy away from some mushrooms if they were easier to find. Three months ago, I felt the urge to have another spiritually lifted night. As I tend to call it. So I call up the guy I usually talk to when acquiring my vision quest materials, and he told me something strange. Hey, Bert, I don't work tomorrow, so I thought I'd make it my night a little special. You have, uh, you have anything available? Bert's voice traveled through the phone in an unusually somber tone. Yeah, I got something for you, but... But what? Some people have been hitting me up saying there's something weird about this batch. Oh, yeah? Weird how? They don't say. They don't seem to like it from how they're acting, so... So I don't know. Maybe it's a strong batch and... They just don't like the intensity? Like I said, it... Um, it's just a guess, though. I sat there on the phone, letting an awkward silence hang in the air for a few minutes as I thought it over. I didn't work the next day, and it had been a few months since I had anything more than some good bud, but it was really my only option when it came to drugs anyway. When you're younger, it's a lot easier to find people with the drugs that you're looking for. However, as you get older, everyone just assumes you're a cop. Nobody will sell you anything. Bert cleared his throat on the other end of the line, pulling me out of my head and hinting at me to continue the conversation. Uh, yeah, sorry, yeah, uh, I'll take my usual three. I'll head out and I'll make my way over to pick them up for me in a minute. Okay, but just realize that I did warn you about this batch. Yeah, I get it. Don't worry. Warning received. Your hands are clean. With that final statement, I hung up and I began to gather my things to head out to my car. Something about the situation... Maybe it was something that Bert had said about the batch had burrowed into the back of my mind. The little mind leech of an uncomfortable feeling wouldn't let go and it made the drive over to Bert's house filled with suspicion. On the one hand, this wasn't the first time I had accepted acid that he said others had thought was too strong. Those times had proved to be just what I was looking for to propel me into a night of speaking with other dimensional beings and flying amongst the stars with a heavy trip. Yet on the other hand, that little brain slug of doubt in the back of my mind wouldn't allow my nerves to settle. When I finally reached Bert's house, my excitement for a good night had managed to overcome the strange feeling I received from our other conversation. Bert and I had been friends for years and years at that point. The two of us had gone to the same high school, remained relatively close after graduation. He only sold weed back in high school, but since grown his cloak and dagger business into providing various hallucinogenics. He typically had either shrooms or acid, or sometimes both. Occasionally, he would have ecstasy. But that was rare. I often had no interest in that. He once had peyote. It was only that one time, but damn, was that really intense endeavor. As I walked into his home, he sat at the table, separating out little paper tabs. His performing this task was in no way odd to me. I had seen him do it hundreds of times. The part that I found unusual about this particular instance was that he was wearing gloves. He never wore gloves for this, often microdosing himself as he separated out hits. So in a way, it was a little added bonus for him besides the money. Uh, hey, what's with the gloves, dude? I asked, not being able to rein in my curiosity. It's just, uh, like a precaution. I told you, man, there's something strange about these sheep. I mean, 
Just look at it. I looked at the small square of paper with a grid of perforations, creating a 10 by 10 sheet of 100 total hits. I immediately knew what he was talking about. Instead of a transparent liquid dripped over a clean white sheet of blotted paper, it was... orange. I don't mean there was a slight yellowing as if the mixture was potent or anything. I mean that it was nearly neon orange and somewhat streaked. Whoa, dude, is that normal? Did you get this from a different guy or something? No, I got it from the same guy, but... I sat back staring at him for what felt like an eternity, just waiting for him to finish his sentence. When it never came, I tried coaxing the rest of what he was saying out of him. But what? Bro, you can't just stop mid-sentence like that and leave me hanging. He seemed to snap out of his impromptu trance, gathering three little tabs that held them out to me before speaking. But he was acting strange and I picked this up from him. Oh uh, yeah? I said as I held out my hand, letting him drop the three hits in my palm. Strange how? I don't really know how to describe it. It was like he had a secret or maybe just a little over paranoid. Come to think of it, his pupils seemed dilated, so he may have been tripping when I got them. Now that I think about that possibility, it doesn't seem strange. Well, oh, shit, man. If he was tripping, then of course. He's going to be acting a little strange. I don't think that I would really read into it too much. With that, I paid him and began to walk out the door to my car. When I reached the door, I realized that the three hits were just sitting in my palm. I had no bag or container to place them in for the trip home. I stood at the door, contemplating how to solve this seemingly minuscule problem. Apparently, I had stood staring back and forth from my hand to the doorknob for much longer than I realized, and Bert called out to me. Hey, Jim, you cool, man? You've been standing there trying to figure out my door for like five minutes now. You just turn the handle, you walk through it. It's not that complicated. A strange tingling wave started from my skull and flowed through the rest of my body twice before I could make my mouth respond. Yeah, yeah, I'm good, I said, as I glanced back at him and then to the tabs in my hand. I smiled to myself as I shook off the last remnants of the strange tingling sensation and tossed all three of the little paper tabs into my mouth, then setting them beneath my tongue to let the acid soak into the veins. I turned the handle and I opened the door. I gave Bert a quick wave goodbye as I stepped through. I saw the utterly shocked look on his face as I closed the door behind me. No doubt his reaction to seeing me take all three hits at once before I even got home. I knew that acid takes typically about 20 minutes to kick in, and my drive home was only 10 minutes, so I'd still have a good 10 or more minutes before it hit to get ready and settle for the wild night that I was about to have. However, I began to get scared on the way home as I began to feel my breathing pattern change, get more waves of shivers and tingles wash over my body. Holy shit. This must be some good stuff, I thought to myself as I parked my car and walked up to my front door. Suddenly, I could no longer feel the tabs under my tongue as I reached for the door handle. I saw them sitting in the palm of my hand. I froze and stared, focusing on the three tiny squares of paper resting gently in my palm. What the fuck? I said as my heart began to race. I brought my hand to my mouth and put the tabs under my tongue, but just as I moved, they disappeared and I could once again feel them soaking in my saliva. The chill ran on my spine, and I began to shake back and forth like a dog trying to dry its fur. I stopped suddenly, realizing that I was performing this strange dance still standing out in the open on my front steps. Get inside, get inside, get inside, get inside, get inside, get inside, get inside. A strange whisper echoed just behind my ear, and I spun around to see who had made it. The view before me blurred, and the street began to form waves like they were made of liquid. The cars passing melted into little more than colorful blobs, rolled for a few feet, and then exploded into various generic vehicle shapes. I closed my eyes and rubbed my eyelids, trying to reset my vision. I shouldn't have hit so soon. Something's wrong. It's wrong. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Something's wrong. Another whisper sounded just behind my ear, causing me to spin around again. I became genuinely terrified at the thought. I had bitten off more than I could chew with this. 
My heart raced, and I, I quickly opened the front door and burst through into my kitchen. I stumbled to the floor, and I kicked the door shut behind me. Hey, Jim, are you cool, man? I've been standing there trying to figure out my door for like five minutes now. You just turn the handle and you walk through it. It's not that complicated. Yeah, I'm fine. Wait, what? What? How did you get to my... The voice trailed off as my kitchen came back into view. I shook my head as another chill surged through my body. This shirt's getting too hot, I said, as I began to pull it off over my head. This is going to be bad quickly. I need something to calm me down. My heart pounded within the prison of my ribcage, and I nearly began to cry with fear as I realized... This is gonna be a bad trip. The voice came from the Alexa speaker on the wall, but it sounded like it was slowed down and way too deep. And I, I gripped at my chest and I tried to slow my heart and felt my shirt. The shirt's getting too hot, I said as I began to take it off. I stopped halfway as the thought of already doing it flashed through my mind. This is gonna, 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 gonna be a bad trip. The warped robotic voice of Alexa came through the speaker again. Shut up! I mean, how would you know? I yelled out. As soon as the words left my mouth, the room felt deathly silent. Another chill screamed through my body as I reached up and I grasped the counter and then finally pulling myself to my feet. I need something to calm me down. I thought again. Alexa, play calm music. I'm sorry. I didn't understand that, little bitch. Please try again. Wait, wait, did she just say that? I tried to remember as I stumbled over the sink and I, I decided I couldn't waste time getting a glass and I turned the faucet on to drink from directly. The water blasted me in the face as if it was a, from a fire hose set to set a maximum pressure. I felt myself nearly drown. Stumbling back onto the floor, I, I turned to ask Kevin what was happening. How should I know? I'm only 14, remember? Wait, Kevin? How are you here? You died when we were kids. How should I know? I'm only 14, remember? Wait, Kevin? Kevin, how are you here? You died when we were kids. I was there when you got hit by that drunk driver. <laughs> Kevin just laughed, but it... It didn't sound right. It sounded guttural and glitchy. I watched as my childhood best friend flickered between normality and entirely brutalized. Just as he had looked after being hit by a speeding vehicle. You know, you, you could have saved my life. Life. No, it wasn't my fault. It was... I was interrupted by the speaker again. I don't think I can help you with that, you pathetic junkie. Shut up! Damn it, shut up, Alexa! I screamed as another jolt of tingles surged through my body. Alexa, play calming music, you stupid bitch! You could have saved me, Jimmy. His voice had changed again to a little more than an echoed whisper, oscillating back and forth in my mind. No, I couldn't have Kevin. You, you aren't really there. You died 15 years ago. A blast of death metal at maximum volume filled the room from the speaker. I quickly covered my ears as Archspire growled and screamed their lyrics. You like that, you little, little bitch. What the fuck is happening? Alexa, stop! Suddenly, the room felt deathly quiet, and I decided to make my way to the couch in the living room to lay down and relax. Maybe... Maybe I could turn on some music visuals on the television to try and redirect this trip. I, I called out for Alexa to turn on the TV as I crawled my way into the room, and instantly, a pain crashed into my stomach, and I puked all over the floor. I couldn't help but scream in terror as I knew that vomiting the tablets back up would cause them to reactivate, so to speak, which would intensify my already out-of-control vision quest. Hey Jim, you cool man? You've been standing there trying to figure out my door for like five minutes now. Handles, yes, I know, Bert. I, I can make... I stopped realizing I was still in Bert's house. Wait, no, I, I wasn't. Wasn't I? Where was I? My couch, that's right. Sir? Who were you talking to? I was talking to... Wait, who are you? How did you get in my... This is my house, right? As I looked at the person, their face melted down to the bone and reformed into my mother's. A look of knowing disappointment across her face just as I began to speak. The entire person liquefied, pouring onto the floor, then 
reformed into my dog from when I was a child and burst into flames. Is this hard enough for you in here? A bellowing voice said, bouncing back and forth between my ears. Somehow I knew it was coming from my long dead dog as it continued to burn and heat the room. Yeah, this shirt's getting too hot. I, I need to take it off, I responded. The dog blew away as mere ashes, and then, as the last ash floated off from the wind, I heard three loud, deep barks. The same barks that I remembered from my dog. I scooted myself over, leaning against the tree so I could look out over the field. Wait, wait, no, no, no. There, there was no tree here. I was in my living room, right? I'm sorry. I didn't understand that. Please try again. Alexa's voice rang out, but sounded as though someone kept changing the recording speed as she spoke. Hey, Jim. You cool, man? I'm sorry. I didn't understand that. Hey, Jim. You alright? Oh, shit. I have to get this under control. What, what if I take a shower? That usually calms me down. The thought of the thought barely formed as they pushed through my screaming and crowded brain. Another shock and wave of chills pulsed through my body as I stumbled my way through the bathroom. I made the mistake of looking into the mirror above the sink. I began to scream with terror as I watched the skin over my face begin to melt and drip into the sink, only for the vision to stutter and start over with my skin still intact. I reeled back, falling into the bathtub that was already filled for some reason with cold water. Uh, I'm calling the cops, you pathetic junkie. I heard Alexis say. Hey, Jim, you cool, man? I've been standing there trying to figure out my door for like five minutes now. You just turn the handle and walk through it. It's not that complicated. Sir, you can't be in there, said my brother as if he was speaking in slow motion. Wait. Wait, what are you doing here? I said just before the water splashed over my face. I fell deeper into the bathtub than I should have been. I fell impossibly deep, sinking down as if there was no bottom. I screamed, but no bubbles formed in front of my face. Instead, colorful and intricate balloon animals were expelling from my throat. I tried to stand and effortlessly rose to my feet. Cool water splashed in my face, another shock and chills flooded my body. The world around me suddenly went black. I awoke to a white room, still breathing warping around me. My head swimming, I looked around, realizing that I was strapped down to the bed, surrounded by sterile white and various strange machines. My mind began to race with confusion and fear. First, a giant weasel burst through the door, morphing into a horse and finally into a human-shaped pile of worms, wearing a police uniform. Well, why am I here? What are you going to do to me? I called out with a tremble in my voice. Son, the pile of worms began to speak out in English. I'm not going to ask you what drugs you've taken, because at this point, it doesn't matter. Do you have any idea what happened over the past 24 hours? The room took a deep breath and expanded out nearly twice its original size, then, then shrank back down to the point where I thought that it would crush both the worm cop that had changed into a lizard wearing a uniform and me. N nothing. I, I went home for the normal night. I, I fell asleep in the shower, so how did I end up here? struggled through my words to make my voice sound calm and normal. He didn't know I had taken anything, did he? I mean, how did any of this get out just being in my house? I knew I should have stayed away from that acid after seeing it. It looked so unusual. It's way past time. Should have worn off. What if it messed me up and never goes away? What if I'm like this forever, just doomed to perpetually trip for the rest of my life, never able to truly function again? My horrified train of thought was interrupted by Officer Lizard speaking again. You were found in a public fountain drowned. They had to shock you multiple times to get your heart started. And you kept screaming about a dead dog, telling someone named Alexa to shut the fuck up. Lizard cop paused for a second, stared at me, apparently waiting for his words to sink into my intoxicated mind. Now do you want to try again and tell me what happened? Because that clearly was not a normal night at home. Hey, Jim. You cool, man? You've been standing there trying to figure out my door for like five minutes now. You just turn the handle and walk through it. It's not that complicated. I'm sorry. I didn't understand that. Instead of answering as the voice echoed in my mind, I turned my head and I closed my eyes. I can't still discern reality from constantly fluctuating world by this never-ending trip. I can't leave this room. 
They won't let me. They don't trust me. But honestly, ever since I took those three little tabs, neither do I. If Las Vegas is America's playground, then the rest of Nevada is America's kitty litter box. And out here, the weirdest turds don't stay buried for long. Elvis was already dead when I ran him over. I'm absolutely convinced of that, whatever Ralphie Jr. says. Even with my shades on, the blazing sun reflecting off the desert made my eyes hurt. And I thought the white tasseled lump on the road was just another mirage until my tires bumped over a beer gut and Elvis burst like a ripe strawberry on the desert highway. Of course, we stopped right away. I snatched Ralphie Jr.'s phone out of his hand before he could upload the gruesome scene to TikTok, and then I moved to inspect the damage. Pretty sure I could smell my shoes melting into the pavement. At first, I was relieved when I saw the middle-aged Elvis impersonator had been a corpse for a while, but then... Then I started to think about how he must have died. A gory rope of intestines led off into the desert behind the guy. Who knew how long he'd been crawling around trying to hold his guts in? Or had the coyotes got to him? Hmm. Coyotes. Ralphie, honey, I began. Get back in the car. By the time I turned around, it was too late. There were four of them between us and the SUV, grayish-brown, dog-like, with bushy tails. Their sunken yellow eyes were hungry. I could see their ribs through their patchy fur. So why were two of them chewing on the tires instead of us? I didn't want to think about the possibilities that they were disabling the SUV on purpose. The other two coyotes approached, stopping about ten feet away, and just stared at us. Waiting. Parched. Cracked dirt in every direction. Sulfur-colored cliffs on the horizon. The shoe-melting strip of road. There was absolutely nowhere to run or hide. When the tires finally deflated, all four coyotes began to circle us. I wondered how much it would hurt to climb a cactus. A blood-curdling howl stopped them in their tracks. They snapped their heads toward the source of the sound, which stood beside a dick-shaped rock on the hazy distance. It looked like another coyote, but that was impossible because coyotes don't walk on two legs. Whatever it was, it yipped and it snarled. A warning at the four starving beasts in front of me, in a language they apparently understood. Looking down the road, I understood why. A gigantic semi-truck was speeding towards us. Ralphie Jr. and I both ran towards it, waving our arms like shipwreck survivors. The driver accelerated, then slowed, then accelerated again, almost like he was too afraid to stop. Either that or nobody had taught him how to shift. And the 18-wheeler skidded to a halt beside us in a cloud of dust. A weather-beaten guy with a Sam Elliott mustache stuck a shotgun out the window. Democrat or Republican? He demanded. What the fuck does that have to do with anything? I snapped. I just want to ride. Sam Elliott mustache man thought this over for a minute. Okay, I guess you guys are human after all. Come on up. Do you always ask helpless stranded women about their politics? I asked crossly as Ralphie Jr. and I settled into the truck's cab. Or am I a special case? Nah, the driver sighed. Had to make sure you could talk. That was the first thing that popped into my head. There's a bad stretch of road. There's some, uh, unnatural things out there, but they can't talk. I was just making sure you wouldn't want them. The other guys would probably say I'm a damn fool for stopping at all. I'm Ted, by the way. Ted Yellowhorse. The interior of the cab smelled like nicotine. Royal Pine car freshener and melted gummy worms, but it was better than being out there. Yep, there's a bad stretch of road, all right. Even before some folks started disappearing a couple months ago. My people call this place Salted Earth. There's nothing can survive out there. Plus, maybe it was already dead to begin with. As Ted rambled on, we passed a dusty abandoned Cadillac with shredded tires and the door hanging open. I figured that was Elvis's ride. Poor guy. Wondered what had made his tires go flat. Oh, shit! Ted slammed on the brakes and clutched the wheel as we rolled over something spiky and hard. The truck jackknifed, rolled over, and I felt my son's pudge slam into the side of my head for the second time in a week. 
After the dust settled and after I'd wiped Ted's cigarette ashes out of my hair and shoved his fallen porno mags off my lap, I realized the predicament that we were in. The truck was laying on its side, and I doubted it was going to cheerfully right itself anytime soon. Ted groaned, blood trickling down his scalp. Outside, a hundred coyotes howled in victory. Ted didn't wake, not even when Ralphie stepped on his face in his flurry to escape. The ice in the spilled 44-ounce drink on my door, now the floor, brought back memories of high school friends comforting me while I puked into the toilet. They rubbed something cold in the back of my neck to snap me out of it. Listen, asshole, I whispered to Ted as I splashed ice onto his neck. You're not just going to bail on us like a minor character in a shitty horror story. Not today. My son and I have been through enough already, and the last time I shot a shotgun, the recoil gave me a black eye. Get it together! Ted groaned and opened his eyes. I freed him from his seatbelt and we climbed out into the late afternoon sun. Broken down vehicles were all around us. It was almost like being back in New Jersey. One sedan had a coyote-sized hole in its windshield, the inside spattered with what was left of the passengers. The pickup truck had lost control and slammed into a rock. The half-eaten driver hung out of the window. Great. This is a bad stretch of road, Ted repeated helplessly. In one hand, he held the bloody cloth to his head, and on the other, the shotgun. He gave the cliffs a thousand stare. There's a cave up there. We need to make it there before sunset. What? I huffed. That's like five miles. No. Eight. Or you can wait for the coyotes. Slogging across the parched dirt, a waterfall of sweat pouring down my back, and flies that felt as big as buzzards biting my neck. I made a silent promise that if I survived this, I'd remove love's hiking from my Tinder bio. Mother Nature is the biggest bitch of them all, I thought, as I rolled my ankle and cringed. How do you know there's a cave up there, Mr. Ted? Ralphie Jr. panted. Some of your ancestors massacred some of my ancestors up there. You know what a massacre is, kid? It's like... Ralphie Jr. murmured. Like what the coyotes did. That's right, Ted glared. Just like the coyotes. The sun was fat and orange as a pumpkin by the time we reached the bottom of the cliffs. There, at least, was something like a trail, even if it was partially vertical. Ralphie Jr. was treating the whole thing like a Boy Scout trip. Ted was surprisingly agile for a man who sit in a truck 14 hours per day, and as for me, I just tried not to look down. The mouth of the cave was in sight before Ted was willing to stop. It was at the top of a hollowed-out dent in the cliff. A big ice cream spoon had scooped out the yellowed rock around us. You two wait here, Ted grunted. He was gone for a long time. I, I shivered as I looked out over the dead land. The strand of wrecked cars and the dark shapes darting amongst the rocks and cacti below. One in particular made me grab Ralphie Jr.'s hand and lay as flat as I could against the still warm stone. It was three times the size of the other coyotes, and was walking straight towards us, as casual as a businessman on his way to early lunch. When it looked at the hollow where we were hiding, its eyes were like two pinpricks of blazing white light. I'm coming, those eyes seemed to say, and there's nowhere to run. Uh, Ted? I shouted over my shoulder. How's it going up there? Good, but you two need to stay there. Why? I was confused. As bait. Ted shouted back. Now, wait a minute. Look, lady, you want to kill this thing? Get out of here or not. Oh, hell no. Bang. I threw myself and Ralphie Jr. to the ground as the loudest noise I'd ever heard blasted down the scooped out canyon. A coyote that had been about to ambush us lay dead in the brush. Ted, it seemed, knew what he was doing. Bang. A yelp. Two more coyotes down. But there stood the largest one, approaching us with an unnatural stride babbling in that yipping, snarling language to the pack that followed it. There was no way Ted had enough ammo for all of them. I closed my eyes, covered my ears, and for the moment, felt bad that the last thing Ralphie Jr. was going to see was his mom shaking like a fucking bowl of jello. Two more shots made my eyes open. Ted was sliding down the cliff in a cloud of dust. The huge, freakish, two-legged coyote was down. And the pack was scattering. It's not going to stay put for long, Ted snapped. Get some rocks, anything, weigh it down. I didn't want to get any closer to the dark, pointy-eared body, but I did as I was told. 
I felt like a cave woman creeping up to the thing with a rock in my hand. Is it... My voice was trembling. Is it a skinwalker? Seriously, lady? Ted groaned. I swear you people see one weird thing in the desert. Suddenly it's all skinwalker this, wendigo that. It's real disrespectful. Especially when what you're looking at is a possessed guy in a fur suit. Up close, the fur did look pretty artificial. And the name tag Buttercup did a lot for Ted's case as well. Given that Las Vegas is only 80 miles away, shouldn't even need to ask where the poor fella came from. Although I do wonder how he got a demon inside of him. Hurry up with those rocks. Ted rumbled behind me. It's not done yet. Sure enough, the thing started to writhe on the ground, even with two holes in its chest. And as it yipped and yiffed in that strange language, the coyotes stopped their retreat. One snapped at Ralphie Jr., who swatted it with a stick. Another sprung at Ted. He sprawled, the shotgun went flying, and the pointy-eared black shadow rose to block out the last pale light of sunset. I grabbed the shotgun, and this time, I paid attention to the recoil. The black furred thing went down again, and soon all three of us were heaping everything we could onto it to hold it down. Ted disappeared up to the cave, and when he came back, there was a red gas canister in his hand. As he soaked and burned the possessed thing beneath the rocks, the coyotes howled. The gas can, I muttered. You knew how to kill that thing. You knew about the cave. You knew you'd need some people for bait. Ted turned to me, backlit by our flaming furry barbecue. You picked us up on purpose. None of this was coincidence. Nope, Ted admitted. Sure wasn't. Maybe it was just the firelight, but it sure looked to me like there was something wrong with Ted's shadow. The forearms were too big, the back bent, the face stretched forward like a muzzle. I'm willing to bet your name's not even Ted Yellow Horse. Maybe even that if we open up the trailer of that truck, we'd find the real Ted Yellow Horse lying dead on top of some cartons of baby formula or something. I re-racked the shotgun. I didn't know if it had any shells left, but sure sounded cool. I heard a snapping sound. Ted's hands were contorted into paws. His arms lengthened sickeningly towards the sandstone. The coyotes fell in line behind him. Salted earth was ours long before you people ever climbed down from the trees. That one thought it could take our territory. His face extended, and his canines twisted into a hideous smile. We're a lot older, and a lot smarter. That one... It's drawing too much attention. I took a step backwards and shrieked as I felt warm fur against my leg. We were surrounded. Here's what you're going to do for me, lady. You're going to fire that shotgun into each of the cars down there. You're going to wipe off your prints, put it in the hands of Ted Yellowhorse, who's indeed in the back of the trailer. You're going to tell the police the story of a kidnapping and a psychotic truck driver. Take your time with the story. Make it real good. Because if it isn't, you give them any reason to disturb our hunting grounds again. All the coyotes howled at once. I got the message. Ralphie Jr. and I are going to crash at the motel while I give my statement to the cops and wait for the SUV to get fixed. After that, we're back on the road. Our destination? Any place where there's no sand. Come on, goddammit! Use the power I've given you! Fight back! His spike-knuckled fist slammed into my bare face, sending me flying through the air and into a nearby tree. Despite the tree's time-hardened and hulking form, I went right through it as if it was merely cardboard. I landed roughly, first skidding over some rocks and then tumbling down a slope, coming to rest in a muddy depression several meters away. Entangled in vines and covered in earth and debris, I tossed and turned amidst the muck, terror making me momentarily ignorant to the pain of the thing's Herculanean punch. The sound of the air above whipping in response to the sudden appearance of something only served to hasten my limbs. I managed to regain a semblance of physical coordination and untangle myself, and rising from the ditch quickly, scrambled towards a moss-covered mound, hiding behind it. I asserted the situation and quickly came to the grim realization 
there was simply nothing I could do. I'd have to either fight back and hope to somehow win, or let it kill me, and hope that the method of death would be quick and painless. The sun, high resting, brilliant and unobscured, seemed to be working against me. There were no substantial shadows in which to hide. All were bathed in an almost mystifying radiance. My attacker needed only to fly past the mound to spot me, with panic rattling in my heart and stifling my breathing. I searched for something. A rock or log or natural club of some kind. One that I could use to strike the thing. Even whilst knowing that, regardless of the object, I'd probably not do any significant damage. Earlier, I had watched it fall from the sky and land on solid rock, cratering the land in the process. A stone, no matter how big, Probably wouldn't even scratch it, but still, I had to think of something. A sudden smell, a faint chemical scent of burning, saved me from being bisected by his ocular lasers. I leapt forward, landing flatly on the ground, as a beam of searing, hard light swept above me, just barely missing my scalp. Turning around, I saw the top half of the mound slide a few inches askew, the lingering incision molten, the moss thereon aflame. Hovering a few feet above the mound was the thing, an infernal star-sent nightmare who'd chosen me for his earthen opponent in some sadistic, interspecies bout. You can fight, or you can die, painfully. If you make me break a sweat, I'll end you quickly. You have my word. But if you bore me, I'll take my time. I'll make sure you know true cosmic antipathy. And then... I'll eradicate every civilization on this planet. The fate of the world is in your hands. What are you going to do? Adrenaline surged as my terror mounted. My muscles, supernaturally endowed with enhanced strength, contracted beneath my skin. My vision blurred as the blood pressure rose, and for a moment I feared that I'd have a heart attack before even throwing a punch. But then an errant breeze blew across my face. And with it came a smell, a whiff of grilled meats. I didn't know from where the smell had come, but knew by its intensity that there were people nearby, relatively speaking. My sense of smell had no doubt been heightened, but even a radius of a few miles were close to two beings who could cross entire regions in a few moments. People nearby almost assuredly meant collateral damage. The recognition of this grim fact had a calming effect upon my body and nerves. It was no longer just my life on the line, or the lives of others following my promised demise. There were people here, now, who I needed to protect from the alien gladiator. Through conscious effort, I brought my rampant vitals under control and I rose to stand, considerably less afraid. The grass smoldered around me, and the combined heat of the laser-blasted area and the blazing sun drew sweat from my body, dampening my dirt-stained shirt. I must have looked ridiculous standing up at the eight-foot-tall, chitin-armored alien, challenging him whilst wearing a t-shirt and sweatpants. But in the moment, I felt, for the first time in my life, powerful ready to defend myself against something markedly greater. Knowing that he'd just swat me down if I tried to engage him in the air, I began my assault with a ranged attack of my own. Utilizing my abdominal muscles and pre-natural control of my digestive organs, I channeled a surge of stomach acid and bile from the depths of my gut, spewing it out of my mouth in a green, noxious torrent. His reaction was one of disgust and disbelief. The torrent struck him before he could even react. Probably stunned by the sheer vileness of the attack, he teetered in the air, and I let out another volley, this one even more acrid than the last. It struck him squarely, coating his monstrous insectoid body, and after a moment of mid-air writhing, he fell landward. My esophagus burned. My gums thrummed, but still, I readied myself for a third shot, knowing that it'd take more than some molten vomit to kill the thing. It had landed a few feet behind the split mound. Rounding this, I found the demon rolling around on the ground, slewing off sheets of my vomit. The stuff burned the grass wherever it landed, and the resultant smell was intolerably noxious. 
My eyes began to water and my nose, already burning, felt as if it would fall off my face if I didn't filter the stench somehow. Quickly ripping off a part of my sleeve, I wrapped the fabric around my nose and again prepared to unleash another spray. But in the brief lapse of focus, the thing had displaced all the vomit. No doubt through some hypersped motion and crossed the distance between us in an instant. With its monstrous strength, it promptly punched a hole through my stomach. Blood and bile gushed outward in a brownish admixture as the thing withdrew its fist from my belly. I fell to my knees as a wave of inexpressible agony overcame me, the sensation of having been abdominally penetrated unlike anything I'd ever experienced before. The alien stepped back and admired his work, cackling evilly as I knelt over from the pain and the partial destruction of my spinal cord. My vision went red and swam. The world seemed to distort and upheave around me. Some instinct heretofore unexperienced told me to push. That's the best way I can describe it, and I, I complied, hoping that it would stifle the thought of facing pain. And miraculously, it did. My hands, which I brought to my stomach in an effort to keep some of my guts held within my body, suddenly slipped against a flat surface. Looking down, I saw that my wound had closed. There was only skin. Freshly grown and slick, mostly with sweat. The only blood present being what had coated my hands and rubbed off. The thought, the instinct to push, had allowed me to rapidly regenerate. Good job. You've mastered one of the most basic abilities of your power set. The creature's blatantly sardonic tone infuriated me. Like a hot-headed child who'd just been knocked down by an older sibling, I stood, wiped away what I could of the blood and sweat, and charged at him. My fist connected squarely in his chest. I had hoped to do to him what he'd done to me, put a hole in his body, only at his heart rather than his stomach. But upon contact with his thickly armored pecs, my hand merely imploded. The fingers collapsing into my palm in a mess of tendons and bone. I cried out before my voice could even carry to the treetops. His hand gripped my throat and I was effortlessly lifted from the ground. Struggling against the strangulation, I tried to kick at him, but his other hand seized my left leg at the kneecap and squeezed. The joint shattered, and this time, a howl did escape me, the air pushing itself to my constricted throat. He laughed loudly and cruelly, his voice even rising to drown out my own. Dismissively, he then chucked me away like a piece of trash, and I fell face first onto the ground not far from where I'd initially landed, following his super punch. My entire body throbbed the twofold agonies of my injuries, despite my superhuman physical resilience. He was just... so much stronger. He could inflict more damage than I could physically, or psychologically endure. Get up! Heal yourself, or I'll set this entire forest ablaze. His demonic voice, more than the sinister words themselves, gave me the motivation I needed. There was nothing but evil in those tones. An utter lack of humanity. It was the voice of one who had, elsewhere on other, remoter worlds, inflicted unfathomable terrors and obscenities upon helpless populaces. The same impulse of pushing I had used before, I autonomously and simultaneously repaired my crushed windpipe and my busted kneecap. The restoration brought its own measure of pain, but I gritted my teeth against it, and I rose to my feet. His jet-black body glistened in the sunlight, like some man-sized, futuristically armored bat. His face, saw-toothed and infinitely ghoulish, gazed at me with an expression of open malice, of satanic mirth. It filled me with rage, horror, and indignation all at once. And I would have abruptly and, no doubt uselessly, charged at him again, but a memory providently recalled, stayed my hand, and I at last realized how I could defeat the super-powered Incubus. Earlier in the day I'd been hiking along a well-worn trail, on a short jaunt not far from my home, whilst rounding a bend in the trail, beside which was a steep cliff, its edge perilously unguarded, I spotted the creature falling from the upper atmosphere, trailing a plume of pitch-black smoke in its wake. It landed at the base of the cliff, cratering the land there, and after only a few moments, rose and flew up into the air, apparently having suffered no major injuries from its atmospheric entry. Had I been a little slower to the point in my hike, I would have been spared the subsequent endowment 
of power and violence. But during his ascent, he had spotted me standing there, dumbstruck, and proceeded to alter his course towards my direction, and thus, thus began the terrifying ordeal. But one thing I hadn't consciously taken notice of, one thing I only recalled when standing face to face with that dark armored nightmare, was the nature of his flight, the mechanism by which it was achieved. It lacked wings. It seemed to accomplish flight by exerting some sort of telekinetic force upon itself, or just as supernaturally by manipulating gravity so that it suddenly became lighter than air in some fashion. Regardless, its body, or rather, two small, unshielding portions of its lower abdomen, would briefly glow upon the activation of the flight ability. Seeing this as it prepared to rise again and rain some new power of death upon me, I got the idea to clog those fortuitously unprotected orifices. Just as its savagely taloned feet left the earth, I again summoned from the depths of my bowels a potent surge of bile, and this time internally honing and sharpening the stream so it would spew forth precisely rather than in great torrential showers, using my tongue as a divider. The flesh of it, naturally impervious to the acidic effects, I split the stream in two, sending dual blasts towards each of the orange-tinged holes in the creature's body. The stream struck true, and the fiend cried out, shocked and agonized. He was immediately grounded. Figuratively, de-winged. I let off the oral assault just as I began to feel woozy, probably from exhorting too much of my gastrointestinal energies. The creature writhed on the ground, my bile burning away at its insides. I watched appalled and awed as his chitinous armor expanded, the flesh beneath swelling and inflaming. A moment later, in a great shower of bits and iridescent blood, the thing exploded. Bile, blood, and black flesh glistened in the radiance of the now midday sun, and I took in the grisly scene as one gazing upon the twinkling surface of a calm lake. I had somehow beaten the creature in its own gladiatorial game. I knew that I couldn't simply let the foul remains of that extraterrestrial asshole linger. I mean, who knows what effects the awful might have on the environment, or the bolder carrion animals. So with one final, all-enveloping spew, I doused the whole area in my acrid bile, melting all evidence of the creature's heinous existence. Toxic smoke rose from the dissolving gore, blackening the surrounding foliage, stinging my eyes as I turned and left. Superpowers were forced upon me, and using them, I fought a powerful alien horror and won. The Earth is safe, I suppose. For now. Hey there, kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, real quick, I'm going to talk about Chilling, the awesome horror app that I'm partnered with. In case you haven't heard, every week, I have new stories released over on Chilling. There's now over a thousand stories on Chilling, with a bunch of other YouTube narrators and professionals to choose from, like some of my friends, like Autumn Ivy. On Chilling, you can do things that you've never been able to do on YouTube, choose from a thousand individual stories that are sorted into curated playlists, or you can even create your own playlist. On Chilling, we give you so much flexibility to listen to anything you want the way that you want. And this includes a chilling, game-changing feature, our ambient menu, where you can change the background sound of the story at any time to fit your mood. So go from raining to a campfire with a press of a button. It's totally revolutionary and you really need to try it. There have been a number of awesome updates to chilling, such as the ability to download stories for offline listening and the new social feature. So now you can discuss your favorite stories with other users and your friends. So we're just getting started. Not only are we adding hours of new content every week, but original video content is also in the works. Chilling is evolving into a must have for all horror lovers. So please go get started with your free trial over at Chilling and check out my personal playlist over there. And now, on to tonight's story. I never liked the crawl space under my house. It's dark, it's full of spiders. Smells of mildew and rotting wood. The ceiling's low, it makes me feel claustrophobic whenever I go there. I don't know what it's about, specifically, but every time I open the door under the stairs to hastily shove some box inside, it feels like there's eyes watching me. Usually, I don't go past the first few feet. And if I do, I hurry back out quickly, feeling my spine tingling with fear. 
hearing things moving in the shadows. I find myself rushing out of there too fast for my own good. I've hit my head on the low doorways leading out more than once, fearing the duck. The house is a back split, so the crawl space is really big. It's the same square footage as an entire floor. The only difference is you have to bend down to go inside, since the ceiling's just a few feet high. Yesterday I had to call a cable guy to come over to hook up a line to my bedroom. The man said that he had to go down to the basement to see the connections. Take a quick look at everything. Told me the fastest option would be to run a line through the crawl space. Then fish a line up the wall from the east end of the house where the bedroom is located. I told him go ahead since he seemed to know what he was doing. Then I went back upstairs to work on my laptop hoping that his fiddling with the connections would be minimal so that I could stay online. After a while I heard his drill and I figured that meant that he was starting his work. I put my headphones on for a Zoom meeting and let him do what he had to do. I've never been the type to watch service people over their shoulder when they're doing a job. The meeting went longer than I expected and I forgot about the cable guy until I got upstairs and saw that he hadn't finished the job like he was supposed to. There was a hole in the wall but there was no cable and there was no box. I went down to the basement and looked around for the guy but he was nowhere to be found. Peeking my head into the dark crawl space, I tried to see if he was still in there, fishing the cable line. I called out his name, but there was no response. Still, I got that feeling like someone was watching me from the crawl space. Hair stood up on the back of my neck, and I tried to ignore the sensation, but it was difficult. I must have knocked off early, I thought to myself. I mean, it was late in the evening, after all. Maybe he would come back to finish tomorrow. And that's when I remembered that I had his number, so I could easily text him and ask what had happened. I thought about calling, but that just seemed easier. Jordan, hey, I'm the customer at the house on Everest. Are you coming back to finish the job? I didn't hear you leave. I was on a Zoom call. After waiting for a while for a response, I gave up on the guy, thinking that he had turned his phone off for the evening. I went back to my office and continued on a project I had been caught up on. My work went late into the night, and it was 3 a.m. by the time I finished up work, and I went to bed. As I walked towards the bedroom, I thought I heard a sound from below the floorboards, like someone's fingernails dragging across the floor, like someone trying to grab hold of something, anything, to stop from being dragged deeper into the shadows. Nope, best not think about those things before bed. I ignored the sounds and got in beneath the covers, putting in my earplugs so that I wouldn't hear them anymore. Just a raccoon or a squirrel, I told myself. Not a cable guy. Not a cable guy being murdered or buried alive. Closing my eyes, I tried to think of anything else. But failed. Eventually, I drifted to sleep. My dreams were uneasy and full of vivid nightmares. Each one more terrifying than the last. And yet, when I woke up, I couldn't remember a thing. I was making breakfast when I heard the sound again. It was coming from beneath me, in the crawl space. I procrastinated for a few minutes before settling on what to do, and then I put on my jeans, a long-sleeved shirt, boots, a pair of thick gloves. I dug out an old dog crate into which I'd corral the pest making the noise. Money didn't grow on trees, and I'd already spent a fortune on the cable insulation fees. This would move. This would have to be a DIY effort. I went down to the basement and took a long look at the door leading to the crawl space. My hands were shaking and my breath was coming fast and ragged as I thought about going in there. The scratching dirt turning noise came again, louder this time, and I steadied myself. And then I reached for the doorknob and turned it. Suddenly the sound from within the crawl space stopped. Whatever it was had sounded briefly like a shuffling movement, like something crawling along on the ground, digging claws into the loose dirt. Hello? I called into the dark space. There was no answer. There was a bare light bulb hanging from the ceiling about eight feet in. It was one of those simple fixtures attached to a chain which you pulled to make the light come on. It looked so close. I took a deep breath and exhaled steam, indicating the crawl space was, for some reason, much colder than the rest of the house. It should have been a clue, but I didn't think about it until later. Ducking my head down, I told myself to stop being so nervous. That spine-tingling sensation returned as I felt eyes on the back of my neck again. Trying to ignore it, I rushed those few steps forward towards the light bulb. All of my instincts were telling me to run now, as if something was creeping up behind me in the darkness. 
but I tried to ignore that sickening feeling. I reached my hand up desperately, groping for the chain to illuminate the darkness. I, I couldn't find it at first. The room was pitch black. Looking back, I saw the door was creaking shut behind me as if blown by a strong wind. But it never had done that before. It slammed closed suddenly, making a loud noise, causing me to jump, hitting my head in the ceiling. Damn it! Ow! Finally, my hand caught hold of the chain and I pulled it down. The light came on briefly, blinding me for a second, but then an instant later, the bulb burst, the hot glass shattering everywhere and bouncing off my closed eyelids as I flinched. When I opened my eyes, I saw the crawl spaces drenched in darkness once again. There was a sound of movement again, this time from near the door, behind me where I had entered. It sounded big, and I realized suddenly that this was not a raccoon or a squirrel that I was dealing with. There was a person down in the crawl space with me. A silhouette moved in the darkness, ducking behind a pillar and out of sight. Whatever it was, it was it moved like an animal, but it was the size and shape of a human being, crawling on all fours like the girl from the ring and moving straight towards me now. My phone was in my pocket, the only light source I could think of, so I took it out quickly and turned the flashlight function on. Just as the light was about to hit the thing, it scuttled behind a pillar and out of sight. But I caught a momentary glimpse of a horrifying feminine face, black eyes, mouth full of rotten teeth. Immediately, the phone began to alert me of a low battery. Of course, the one time I forgot to charge the damn thing. My heart was pounding now after seeing what it was up against. Not a rat or a squirrel, but a thing with pale skin and long black hair obscuring its features. Malnourished, emaciated with the vague look of a young girl moving crab-like through the shadows. At least that's what my mind was telling me I'd seen. I scurried further into the crawl space, away from the thing, terrified as I heard the sound of it moving constantly closer. It was impossible to see where it was in the shadows, but I made out a silhouette of something hunched over occasionally, crawling on all fours, ducking behind boxes and pillars to keep out of sight. It moved quickly with jerky, rapid strides, much faster than any human being. There was a wall coming up, I realized. I didn't have much more space to maneuver. The thing was closing in on me, and I had to come up with a plan. But before I could think of anything, I tripped over a lumpy pile. I thought it was a bunch of clothes at first until I looked down and saw more details in the light of my phone. It was the cable guy. His face was slack and his jaw hung down. A puddle of blood was leaking from his mouth, and several dozen stab wounds could be seen on his chest and abdomen. A large drill was clutched in his hand, as if someone had snuck up on him while he was working. The cordless drill had a massive drill bit attached to it, at least two feet long. I picked it up. I tested the trigger. It whirred to life, making a loud noise. Step any closer. I'll drill your face. I screamed at the thing in the crawl space. The scurrying sound kept coming, drawing nearer and nearer until eventually I could hear movement from right beside me and felt a cold hand grasp my ankle and squeeze. I screamed, pulling away with every ounce of strength I had, but the creature was strong. Its grip on my ankle was like a vice, and I thrashed and struggled to get away. I kicked it in the face again and again, hearing teeth breaking and bones cracking, until eventually the thing relented and released me. Jumping up, I banged my head hard on the ceiling again, hard enough to draw blood this time as it caught on a loose, rusty nail. I yelped in pain. I crawled away as fast as I could, dropping the drill on the ground and then running out of there with my head ducked down in a low, shuffling gait. When I got out of the crawl space, I slammed the small door shut behind me expecting something to come and start banging and scratching at it the moment I did. But instead, there was just silence. As if I had just imagined it all. But I knew what I saw. Racing upstairs, I dialed 911 on my phone, but then was surprised to see flashing lights outside already. As it turned out, my neighbors had heard my screams and had called the police. Not something you can count on every neighbor to do. I ran outside and told the cops what happened. My story was met with a few dubious looks, especially when I told them about the creepy girl and the dead cable guy, but they said that they would take a look. Feeling worried for their safety, I begged them to be careful. Bring lots of backup, I said. Whatever the girl is, she's straight from hell. Their eyes were concerned, and I overheard one officer whisper something to another. Looks like you got another 5150, he said quietly. I was ushered into the back of the police car to wait for word from inside. A few minutes later, they came back out were shaking their heads, looking at me with anger. The cable guy was with them, bleeding from his abdomen and clutching his wounds. They pulled me out of the back of the car, and I saw the cable technician's eyes flash black as coal for just a moment, and he snuck me a smile. But then his face went back to a look of outrage again. 
Yeah, that's the son of a bitch you tried to kill me. Down in the crawl space, just now. The dead little girl down there, too. Just look around, you'll find her. Who knows? There might be more of them down there, for all I know. I felt sick. Dizzy, detached, like I was in a dream while awake. You got nothing to say for yourself? Cop asked before his partner slapped his arm. We don't want anything to hurt our chances of nailing this freak. They put me in handcuffs? I listened as they recited the words I'd heard a thousand times in movies and TV shows, but never thought I'd hear from myself in real life. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can and will be used against you in a court of law. I'm up for a murder charge now. I mean, at least I get computer time once a week, though. Allow me to do some research, and I'm finding out all sorts of things about my assailant. Maybe I can convince the judge that what happened to me was real. Looks like I'm not the only one who experienced these sorts of things. If you've seen anything like this recently, please tell me, okay? So I know I'm not alone, so the police and the courts know this is real. I didn't kill the girl. I, I didn't attack that cable guy. He's possessed by the same thing that was inside of her, and hopefully... Hopefully, I can prove it before I get the death penalty. What would you do if you could be invisible? Could you walk around naked all the time? I did that for a while. It's all right. A little chilly, though. Would you stalk your celebrity crush? Maybe get your own private celebrity sex tape? I mean, don't lie. Totally would. I did. Would you steal? Would you kill? Would you travel the world, see everything? How much depraved shit can you think of? Or would you use your power for good instead of evil? Liar. I was born with the gift of invisibility, or I guess you could call it a curse, depending on how you look at it. See, at first, I didn't realize my power. It bothered me for a long time. I'd be standing there with a group of friends talking about sports or music or whatever, and then suddenly, they wouldn't see me anymore. No matter what I did or said, they would just ignore me. Even my words didn't register as if I were speaking into a void. My parents did it too. I'd be in the car with them, around the dinner table, having a conversation when suddenly, it was like I didn't exist. My parents would talk back and forth about their day when... And when I told them about something exciting that happened to me at school, they'd just ignore me. In class, I would put up my hand and the teacher's eyes would skip over me, only to ask someone else for the answer. Girls ignored me. Guys ignored me. Couldn't make friends no matter how hard I tried. My family moved to another city the year I started high school, and the problem became even worse. The friends I had made as a little kid were no longer around, and I was alone all the time. That was around when I realized what was happening. I was turning invisible. That wasn't happening all the time, but it was occurring more and more frequently as I got older. And as I became more shy and introverted, I was scared to get to know anyone, scared to talk to anyone. All I could think about was the fact that if I did make a new friend, they were going to start ignoring me at some point. And I would be alone again. So I just wandered the halls during lunch hour at school, feeling alone and invisible. I got through high school and college blending in with the walls and getting more lonely by the day. I was terrified of forced socialization via any group projects that were presented to us. The idea of interacting with other human beings on a face-to-face -face level was becoming more and more scary to me. Part of me felt like... I might become invisible, and I might never be seen again, forced to wander the earth as a ghost for the rest of my days. Every time I disappeared, I was sure I would stay that way, and it was never voluntary. But every time I disappeared, I became visible again later on. The worst part was I couldn't tell when it was happening. I could always see myself no matter what. After college, I landed a job, which didn't require me to interact with anyone, except occasionally with co-workers and my boss. Most of my conversations happened through email, and even those were ignored half the time. Even as an adult, nobody talked to me in the office or invited me for drinks with the gang after work. Meetings proceeded without me, and people walked past my desk every morning without saying hello. 
as if I didn't exist. A while back, the thing I'd been fearing most finally happened. My boss called my cell phone in the middle of a workday. I missed the call since I had it on vibrate. I looked down to see the notification on my phone. I was about to go into his office to talk to him when he came out and began to yell loudly. Where's Jordan? Has anybody seen him? Every time I need his help with something, he's nowhere to be found. He sounded angry. I stood up and I raised my hand. I'm right here, Mr. Jacobson. What do you need my help with? Nobody heard me. Another co-worker, a man named Brett, who had always had it out for me, stood up and began to complain about my absence as well. I'm not sure where he is, sir. Every time I look over at his desk, he's conspicuously absent. I was going to say something to you, but I don't like to complain about my co-workers. This is getting ridiculous, though. Mr. Jacobson shook his head, muttering under his breath, and marched back towards his office. One more phone call. If he doesn't pick up this time, I'm firing his ass. I hurried after him, leaving my phone on my desk. Sir, wait, please, I'm right here. He slammed the door in my face. I tried the doorknob, but it was locked. I knocked and yelled, but he didn't answer. When I got back to my desk, there was another voicemail waiting for me. This one saying I was fired for my unexplained absences from work. There seemed no point in trying to stop it from happening. I just packed up my things silently and left. Nobody noticed. The periods of invisibility grew longer and longer until finally... I came to realize that I could only be seen one day a year. For the rest of the year, all 364 days, I was a ghost. It was always the same day, and it was easy enough to remember. It was my birthday. It made sense. People noticed me on that day and remembered me, even if it was just for 24 hours. I'd get a call from my parents and a few Facebook messages, but that was about it. Still... It felt nice to exist again. I didn't have a job anymore, so I had to start getting creative with ways to make money. I still needed to pay my bills and buy groceries. It helped that nobody could see me. That made the next part easier. Those first few times hopping the counter of the bank were nerve-wracking. My heart was racing, and I was just waiting for someone to start yelling at me, threatening to call the cops. But after I'd done it about ten times, it felt more or less like going to the grocery store. I just hop over the counter and grab a stack of bills from the teller drawer when they weren't paying attention. The second I touched the bills, it was like they didn't exist anymore and the bank tellers didn't even notice them leaving the drawers. Part of me didn't mind stealing from banks, since they took money from customers all the time without apology. But I didn't want to steal from a mom and pop store or a grocery store. I wanted to be normal as much as possible. Besides, I was having fun with bank robberies in broad daylight. There was a thrill in making money from the bank right in front of the teller's eyes. That feeling was a rush. Pretty soon, I was chasing that feeling all the time. Finding expensive merchandise to steal was easy, and stealing it was even easier. But you realize pretty quickly that possessions are hollow and meaningless. You can have anything that you want at a whim. I took cars from big dealerships, Porsches, Ferraris, BMWs, Lamborghinis, Mercedes, you name it. But driving wasn't a great idea in my condition. I got into a lot of car accidents. People never saw me coming. It's no fun driving a sports car if you can't drive it fast. Believe me. Somewhere along the line, I must have drawn attention to myself because one night, as I was walking home, I saw someone standing on the sidewalk in front of my house, waiting for me. The man was wearing a black trench coat and a fedora. He had sunglasses on despite the darkness. I slowed my approach when I saw him, but felt drawn towards him like a magnet. So, you're the one I've been hearing so much about, he said, seeing me despite my invisibility. The one who's been causing so much trouble, drawing so much attention to us. You can see me? I said, surprised. How can you see me? Because I'm just like you, he answered. I'm a shadow. So are they. From all around me came shapes from the darkness. Some of them were people, but others... Others were really just like shadows, barely tangible in the night. They grabbed hold of my arms and legs, tightening their grips on me as I screamed. It felt like I was being mugged by a pack of boa constrictors. Shh, 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 the man said, putting a finger on my lips, silencing my screams. Nobody can hear you except for us. Who are you? I said nervously, my heart pounding, 
looking around at their faces. Some were featureless and without form. But the same as you. We're here to teach you how to be a better shadow. How to remain unseen. You've been too blatant in your movements. People are starting to notice you. The tellers of the bank are finding cash missing at the end of the day. And the grocery store owner is wondering why nobody notices the mysterious customer who leaves a pile of cash after shopping. But a ghost is visiting the store. What do you want me to do? I asked. I can't work. I, I need to get food somewhere. No, you don't. You're a shadow, remember? Shadows don't eat. They don't drive BMWs, and they don't visit the bank. You're not being a very good shadow. That's why we're here to teach you. They began to press in tighter around me, and I felt myself being compressed like a lump of coal, being turned into a diamond. I was shrinking into the ground, becoming flattened, and at the same time losing some essential essence of myself. I felt like my personality was being compressed, like my soul was being photocopied into a lower resolution version of itself, becoming a sliver. And then, even less than that, never in my life had I felt so afraid, so unsure. And finally, all I could see were the figures looming over me, towering high above me from my insectile vantage point. I was nothing more than a shadow on the sidewalk to them, and to everyone else as well. There. That's better. Now you're a proper shadow. The group of them disappeared. And I found myself alone. Terrified. Being a shadow has not been anywhere near as nice as being invisible. I got into all sorts of trouble when I was invisible, let me tell you. I had a lot of fun. I got into a lot of depraved mischief. In retrospect, I'm not that surprised that I got caught. I'm more shocked at how it happened. And the consequences of my actions were very unexpected. It's a pretty terrible punishment being made into a shadow. Especially since shadows never die. They don't have a lifespan or anything like a normal person. Or even... Even like an invisible person. Still, once a year on my birthday, I become tangible again. I get to see my family, I get to breathe the fresh air and eat food and drink wine, and I get to be a person again. Today, and only today, I find myself taking more advantage of life than I used to. I go to see my parents on my birthday these days. I visit my old friends, I go to the park. I say hello to perfect strangers as I walk around in sunshine. Only real people can enjoy the sunshine. Shadows never get to feel it. Tomorrow I'll be a shadow again. And it's a very cold life. But for now I'll enjoy the warmth of the sun. Even if it's only for a little while. The rocky dirt road crunched under the truck's tires as I drove through the dense forest careful of the branches which overhung the path and scraped the windows. My eyes were darting around constantly, keeping an eye out for wildlife and fallen trees. This far into Yosemite, there weren't many people, but as a park ranger, it's my job to patrol these woods and protect visitors from nature as much as possible, not to mention protecting nature from them, especially this time of year when unlicensed hunters were out and clueless campers and amateur hikers were roaming alongside them. It's often a lethal combination. Just as I was thinking about amateur hikers, I saw a woman standing a little ways off on the road. She was in a rock-strewn field on a slope, leading up a hill to my left. Despite the fact that we were out in the middle of nowhere, she had no hiking equipment, no backpack, nothing. As I got closer, she saw me, but began to walk away, marching up the rocky slope. This far out in the middle of nowhere, I expected a wave or a hello at the very least. Most of the time, if you're out here on foot, you don't see anyone for days at least. Hey miss, you okay? I yelled, worrying that she was suffering from exposure. Sometimes people get lost in these woods. By the time you reach them, they're near catatonic. I've seen it before. Men and women with a thousand yard stare. She didn't respond. Instead, she continued up the slope until she reached the top. And she disappeared into the tree line. 
The woman's face looked familiar, I realized. He pulled out a file on my laptop. It showed people who had been reported missing in the area. It took a minute, but eventually I found the woman's file. There were photos that matched the person that I had just seen exactly, except her clothes were different, and the woman had been reported missing eight months prior. She should look considerably worse, I thought. I mean, especially considering her lack of supplies. These woods were harsh. It's a brutal wilderness. Even experienced hikers and hunters had become lost in these areas and had died from the elements. I quickly called into the station and told them what I'd seen. Then I grabbed my backpack and I took off on foot, running up the rocky slope towards the trees. If she continued at the pace she'd been moving, I had a good chance of catching up with her. At the top of the hill, I managed to find her tracks. I followed them into the woods, tracing a path through the trees. For almost an hour, I followed her path through the forest, becoming more and more convinced that I should have caught up with her. I realized something was wrong. I had lost the trail. It was like the woman had vanished. I kept moving forward, thinking maybe I'd pick up her tracks again. This happened sometimes, I knew as an amateur hunter. The quarry's path would disappear occasionally, only to reappear a little ways away. So I kept going, kept pushing aside branches and shrubbery, and moving even deeper into the overgrown wilderness. And that was when I saw it. The hell is that? I muttered to myself, not believing my own eyes as the object came into focus up ahead. It was a staircase that appeared out of the overgrowth, looking otherworldly in this element. It was a staircase that appeared out of the overgrowth looking otherworldly in this element. What's this doing out here? I realized I was talking to myself, but I couldn't help it. I also couldn't seem to help the fact that I was steadily moving towards the staircase in the forest, despite a growing feeling which told me I should stay away. The closer I got to the stairs, the more I felt as if someone was watching me. The hair stood up on the back of my neck and goosebumps rose up on my arms as I approached, moving closer and closer until I was standing right in front of it. Strangely enough, the stairs looked relatively new. They appeared unassuming and normal in every way, except for their odd location. The wood was not weather-worn, the moss cover it was clean, and I would guess it had been built in the last 10 or 20 years. The staircase ended after exactly 13 steps. It was a staircase leading to nowhere. It was an eerie sight out here since I was well aware of how difficult it would be to construct them in the middle of nowhere. What was the purpose of them? Who would build them? And why? Even as I was asking myself these questions, I found myself walking up the stairs. It was like I was in a dream as my feet seemed to move involuntarily upwards, but the feeling of eyes on the back of my neck grew worse and worse with each step. And I could feel the weight of someone else's movements in the stairs with me, how sure of it. Eventually the paranoia became so overpowering that I had to turn around, feeling as if someone or something was definitely right behind me on the stairs, but when I turned around there was no one there. Suddenly I felt terrified as hell, and started wondering what I'd been thinking climbing those stairs in the woods that shouldn't have been there. I started back down, still feeling eyes watching me from all around. The trees nearby rustled with movement. I saw a vague shape moving behind them. Hurrying the remainder of the way down the stairs, I called out to the figure, thinking it was the woman that I had seen earlier. Miss, if that's you, I've been looking all over for you. Are you all right? I asked the dark figure in the shadows, but it didn't move or respond, instead it just, it just continued to watch me. Okay, lady, I can't help you if you don't. Suddenly it occurred to me that the figure in the shadows was too tall to be the woman I'd seen earlier. It looked to be a person at least six and a half feet tall, maybe, maybe more, and they were ducking behind a tree so as not to be seen clearly. The thing stood up even taller. And I realized it had been crouched down. It, it was enormous. Its form impossible to examine in the low light, but it was definitely watching me. 
and there were more of them, I realized. My heart pounded faster and harder until it felt like it was going to beat right out of my chest. I spun around looking at the forest all around me, seeing shadowy shapes everywhere. For a few long moments, I was frozen. I was unable to move or breathe or think. And then I saw a long-fingered hand pushing back the foliage, preparing to emerge. That woke me up from my trance. Whatever these things were, I could tell they were not benevolent or good. They were creatures of darkness, luring people to them so they could feast on their minds. I tore my gaze away from it and I began to run. Racing through the trees, I could sense them following after me, a platoon of lanky, impossibly tall creatures with long fingers. Were they the ones who had created the staircase out here? Were they aliens, sasquatches? I had no idea, but every time I looked back over my shoulder, I saw them gaining on me. Vague shapes moving so quickly they blurred and were tough to make out. And that was when I realized it was getting dark outside. I mean, but that didn't make sense. Since when I'd set out, it had been the early morning hours, maybe 8 a.m. Checking my watch, I saw it was no longer functioning, nor were my cell phone calls or my GPS devices. With no other choice but to keep running, that's what I did bolting through the forest until eventually I found the rocky slope beside the dirt path where I had left my truck. I ran right over the edge of the cliff, so terrified and frantic, I didn't see it coming. The things were just behind me by that point, and I was almost ready to resign myself to dying, trying to fight them, and instead I went tumbling down the rock-strewn hillside, somersaulting, hitting my elbows, my knees, my shoulders, and my skull off the boulders and stones. A mini avalanche ensued, and I went down hard, face-planting as my feet were unable to keep up with the momentum. A sharp pain struck me in the forehead, and I tasted blood in my mouth as my vision went dark. I laid in a pile of rubble, and I went to sleep. When I woke up, there was a park ranger standing over me, asking if I was okay. Weird thing was, I didn't recognize him. You look familiar, he said, furrowing his brow. What's your name? I told him, and his jaw dropped, his face turning a shade paler. It can't be. Everybody thought you were dead. Looking around, I saw my truck was nowhere to be seen. It was a different season as well. Trees were turning slightly yellow when I went into the forest. An early signal of autumn, but now they were bright green, as they would be at the beginning of summer. What's the day today? I asked him. He told me, but I didn't believe him at first. You're making that up, I said, shaking my head. I just went into the woods for a couple of hours to find that woman. And that's when I remembered her again. Did anyone find her, or is she missing? Nobody's seen any woman, just like nobody's seen you for eight months. His eyes were suspicious, and I realized he thought I was losing my mind. But I'd lost it out in the forest. I shook my head and looked back out into the woods. We gotta get a search party out there! Did you hear me? If you saw a woman when you went out there, she's long gone by now. My eyes stayed fixed firmly on the trees in the distance. Not for her, there's... There's something else out there. I couldn't resist the pull of it, and I started wandering back up the rocky slope. I felt like I was an iron filling, and that staircase was the strongest magnet, drawing me towards it. We all need to go to it. The other ranger grabbed my arm and pulled me back, restraining me, yelling at me to calm down. It took five more men to get me to stop, and they get me into the hospital. They kept telling me what I saw wasn't real, that I was suffering from exposure, that I got lost in the forest and hit my head, suffering a concussion. The doctors say that I hallucinated all of it. But I know what I saw. And as soon as I get out of this hospital, I'm going back. Hey there kids, it's me, Mr. Creepypasta, and before we get started on tonight's story, I'm going to let you know about two ways to find more stories from this author. How to Build a House, Strange, Unsettling, and Unforgettable Tales, Where Nightmares Dwell, and House with 100 Doors and Other Dark Tales Never Sleep Again, both by Travis Brown, or Grand Theft Motto. 
the author of tonight's story. And you can find both in the description down below. Available now on Amazon. And now, on to tonight's story. I always suspected that my dad's barbershop was haunted. And heck, he used to make that claim himself. A lot of customers, particularly the old timers, had their own little superstitions, their favorite chairs, and days that they avoided coming in for a haircut. My dad, the barber, was the worst of all, though. The man would only use one particular brand of scissors and another for electric razors. He used regular straight razors a good bit, too, except for one antique blade with a pearl handle that he refused to handle. Most curious of all, Dad would always leave the last chair in the corner empty, no matter how packed the shop got. No one would be seated in that chair. He never told me why, only that it was tradition. Dad passed away a few months back. I found him at the barber shop, slumped in one of the chairs, looking for all the world like he was sleeping. It was never my plan to get into the family business. As of last spring, I was still in college, working on my degree, but when Dad died, somebody had to take care of the family, so I got the certifications I needed, and I started cutting hair. Luckily, Dad prepped me for years growing up, and I didn't scare away any of the old customers. Not at first. However, I noticed some of the guys looking a little nervous when they came in. Eventually, a few of the regulars began dropping off. I decided to ask Bill, one of my dad's favorite clients, to hang out after work at the shop one day so I could ask his advice. What am I doing wrong, Bill? I asked. What's causing folks to leave? I was sweeping up for the day. Shop closed and quiet. Bill sat in his favorite chair sipping a beer. Well, Joey, I'm glad you asked me to stay late, he replied. I would mean to have a word with you. The reason you're scaring away the old timers is simple. Not respecting your dad's rules. I bristled at that a bit and I leaned my broom against the wall. Do you say I'm, I'm not doing a good job running my dad's shop? Oh, no, 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 Bill said, hands held up in a calm gesture. You're doing a great job of cutting hair. You're personable. Everybody likes you. It's just... What? Kid, you're not following the rules. You're mixing brands. Using all the chairs. Oh, superstitious stuff. Bill stood up. Might sound silly to you, but traditions meant a lot to your dad. To all of us. The old guys, at least. He'd just like to see you respect that. I nodded. I told Bill I'd consider it. We shook hands and he left, locking the door behind him at my request. I went back to cleaning up, but... Bill's words stuck with me. Dad's favorite straight razor, the one with the pearl handle, was sitting in its usual place of honor next to one of the mirrors in the corner. Starting to gather dust since I wasn't polishing it as much as my dad did. Or at all. I picked up the razor and I opened it. The blade still looked as sharp as ever. I suppressed a chill. I felt like the temperature in the barbershop dropped by 10 degrees in as many seconds. The lights flickered, heard a squeak, and I, I looked in the corner. The last chair, the one my dad always left empty, was facing me. I was positive that I left it turned towards the counter and mirror earlier that day. Maybe the place really is haunted, I muttered, closing the razor and placing it on the shelf. I'd meant the line as a joke, but it came out as almost a question. The barbershop was warming up again, but I began to feel like I wasn't alone. I considered leaving and skipping my usual closing routine. That would be, admittedly, that I was afraid. Though, though my dad's superstitions were more than comfortable little rituals. I went back to cleaning up, polishing the mirrors in front of the chair, and when I reached the last chair in the corner, a special one, I felt a wild urge rise up in me. I sat down. Immediately, the temperature in the room plummeted. I saw my breath come out in a cold, white cloud. There was a tinkling sound. I, I turned to see the pearl-handled razor vibrating on its shelf. Joey. The voice sounded familiar. Terribly, impossibly familiar. 
I swiveled in my chair until I was facing the mirror. The lights flickered again. In the flash of darkness, I saw my dad's reflection in the mirror standing behind me, except he didn't look entirely like my dad. His face was stretched and blurry, constantly shifting and reforming. After a moment, it clarified and looked like my dad, only younger. Much younger. He looked like he was my age. I saw his reflection shimmer and turned to look at something towards the front of the shop. Suddenly, I could hear a warble that slowly crystallized into my dad's voice, just like his reflection. The voice was decades younger than the last time I saw him. Sorry, we're closed, I heard him say. I glanced at the razor on the shelf. It was shaking like a box of alarm clocks. I realized that I was shaking too. I, I swallowed a scream. The room was growing colder by the moment. I turned back to the mirror to see frost collecting around the edges. My dad's reflection was still looking away towards the front of the shop. I changed the angle of the chair and saw who he was talking to. A man, very young and skinny, dressed in a moth-eaten hoodie. While I watched, the man pulled out a knife. I saw his mouth move but couldn't hear the words. Still, it was easy enough to guess that this was some kind of robbery, albeit a, a pathetic one. Get out, I heard my dad say. Just get out of here. I saw the handle of the pearl grip razor poking out of my dad's white barber coat. The burglar, barely more than a teen, moved suddenly, but my dad was quicker. It was hard to follow, but there was a spurt of blood that made me duck. I poked my head back up and realized it was only the phantom reflection of blood as seen through the mirror. Now there was a new image. My dad in his white jacket stained red, kneeling over a man that attacked him. Dad was holding the young guy's hand. The burglar's throat ripped open by the razor. The man kept trying to speak, but only blood came out. Dad was crying. In an instant, the mirror was back to normal and the shop was warm again. He stood up, shaking. It was self-defense, I said. It wasn't Dad's fault. But I knew that wouldn't have mattered to my dad. He was a good man, kind. Even if he was justified in taking a life to protect himself, the guilt would have weighed heavy on him. All of Dad's superstitions, his respect for the razor and leaving a chair open clicked. The seat was a sign of respect for the man who died there on the floor all those years ago in the, the razor. Used as a weapon, he could never cut hair again. But he wouldn't throw it away. Dad would keep it as a reminder of one of the worst nights of his life. I took a deep breath and I looked back at the chair in the corner. It was facing the counter again, and the, the razor with the pearl handle was still. Instead of running out of the barbershop screaming, I went back to cleaning up. I finally understood my dad's superstitions, and I, I'd be sure to honor them in the future. The shop was haunted, but as long as it was treated with respect, I knew it would stay quiet. Then I knew the regulars would come back. I awoke to darkness, which itself wasn't surprising since I had fallen asleep just as the sun was going down. What was surprising, what was vaguely concerning, was the nature of the darkness. Its apparent density, its widespread occupation of my ordinarily ambiently lit living room. I had fallen asleep on my couch facing away from the TV, which I had left on, tuned to some dead channel. But upon waking, my darkened vision showed the ceiling. A dim circle, the only evidence of the ceiling fan thereon. Something had drawn me out of my dreamless sleep. And caused me to half turn in the process of waking. As if I had been called. 
Something had snuffed out the lights of the various devices throughout the open space, replacing them with an almost preternatural darkness. In any other situation, I would have just gotten up, turned on the lights, and done a little investigating, perhaps finding that I had been awakened by a forgotten alarm or some louder-than-usual sound from one of the tenants above or below me. But lying there, staring up at the canvas of black that was my ceiling, I felt it absolutely imperative that I not get up. That I not even turn my gaze away from the barely discernible fan. The immediacy and severity of this feeling, this disinclination to do anything but lie there, was itself alarming. I listened, the thought coming to me that someone had broken in and my body was simply responding to its primal programming of predatory avoidance. But I heard nothing. That is, nothing unusual. They were only the typical sounds of apartment living, most of which I had grown accustomed to months ago. Still, anxiety took hold within me, a small panic mounting as my mind failed to reconcile the feeling of vulnerability with a lack of evidence for a hostile presence. My physical senses told me nothing, and yet instinct, intuition, and, and whatever else constitutes more abstract sensory perception told me that I was in danger, that there was something very near, something that would, upon noticing my activity, inflict unthinkable violence upon me. Seconds passed, minutes, and I eventually realized that I was feeling unwell. It began as a sensation not entirely dissimilar to indigestion, but then quickly retweaked itself so that it manifested as something more cardiac. I felt my heart flutter and pound within my chest, and I sensed somehow in this hyper-aware state my body grew more vascular, the veins pressing against my skin as if the blood flowing through them had developed a fluidic sentience and wanted out. This alarming feeling waned a little after a few tension-filled moments, but again evolved into a new sensation, this time localized entirely within my head. A migraine, sudden and fierce, came to me, and had I not been so utterly terrified of detection, I would have cried out and rolled onto the floor. Instead, as subtly as I could, I buried the back of my head into the couch cushion as if, as if I could somehow grind out the pain, all the while keeping my eyes trained on that featureless swath of black above. Something was happening to me, a process that almost felt like some highly invasive probing or upwards traveling scan, an increasingly uncomfortable evaluation of my physiology. When the migraine subsided and I was left a sweating, tremulous mess, I decided that I could not mentally withstand another episode like that. With immeasurably slow movements, I inched my head so that by pressing my eyes to the very edge of their sockets, I could gaze towards the coffee table, which sat between the couch and the TV. But even these minute and glacially undertaken motions had drawn the attention of previously unseen things. Just when my right eye caught sight of it, it rose from its perch on the coffee table, rearing up in malignant glory and amidst the fulsome darkness. I managed to flick my eyes away immediately, but I had seen it, and in doing so had brought its full attention upon me. The subsequent feeling of dread, the sheer implacable terror that came upon me, the most demon-haunted phobia-filled nightmares can scarcely compare to that single, short-lived instance of monstrosity. It was as if I had gazed upon Satan himself, orating before his undivine legions at pandemonium. When my face turned back towards the ceiling, I stared fixated, as one petrified by a Medusian gaze, rendered entirely still in my inexpressible terror and not only sensed the thing looking at me, observing me with its demonian and inscrutable gaze, but felt on a deep spiritual level its close presence, the titanic inhumanity of it. Had there been others there with me, I'm sure they would have felt the same. Such a loathsome and deeply supernatural thing could not exist amongst the sane and mundane without affecting them in some way. It emanated evil. I don't know how much time passed before I lost it. 
maybe seconds, maybe hours. One moment I was lying there, steeping in darkness, my body pitifully flailing to maintain any worthwhile degree of homeostasis in the presence of this ultra heinous entity. And the next I was screaming, crying, spurting and babbling hysterically, insensibly like a coat restrained lunatic shrieking in the back of some asylum. I just couldn't take it anymore. My mind not equipped to handle being in the proximity of something so existentially inimical to human nature. What silenced me, what curbed my madness, and has kept me incurably awake since, it was not the bite or claw marks of some pit-escaped fiend. I wasn't attacked. Not in a way I can reasonably, accurately articulate. And what could have been the height of, or a dip in my mania, a subtle yet profoundly terrifying thing happened. My ceiling blinked. In a moment of acute mind-collapsing despair, I realized that I had not been staring at my ceiling fan. The thing that I'd mistaken for it was actually an eye. Black and massive, into which I'd been desperately staring for hours. As if in its tenebrious lens I'd find salvation from the lesser nightmare perched beside me. An instinctual glance, a knee-jerk reaction of fear, rightward showed the unwholesome, gargoylean horror still there on the coffee table. But only then did I realize that it was joined with the coffee table, and it joined with the carpet, and the TV behind them both, and everything else minimally observable in the essentially lightless room. The room was so dark, not because of some unprecedentedly dark night, but because something had covered the walls and floors so totally that it simply appeared that way. I was not enshrouded, but encased. Bottled up inside something larger than life, blacker than space. For hours I had lain awake in the maw, the, the gullet or bowels of some immense... The cessation of my screams marked the thankfully temporary implosion of my mind. I didn't move or even blink for hours, till finally, for some reasons unknowable to me, the thing receded into whatever void or dimensional abscess it had come from, and light arrived not long after, filled the room, returning a faint sense of normalcy to the world. But the dread remained. My despair lingered. The horror of that omnipresent affront to sanity remained within the forefront of my psyche keeping me numb and paralyzed. I had always enjoyed sleep. I looked forward to it pretty much from the moment I began my day. But now having seen what happened during the hours when the mind and the body are at their most vulnerable, when reality is, for whatever reason, malleable, I don't think I'll ever again look forward to the advent of night. Now I dread it. I have no notions left of sanity. I no longer hold any illusions about personal safety. Eldritch, obscene things can, on a whim, enter into our reality and unravel our minds. And there is nothing we can do about it. When my husband saw the man in the purple suit, he spat his pastrami sandwich all over my fake Chanel purse. That guy's supposed to be dead, he coughed. My son, who was too young to understand that my husband choked to death, would be the best thing that could happen to our family, patted his father's back with a fat little hand. Here's the thing about gangsters. They've got loose lips. All that tough guy and murder stuff died out with the ones who came over from Italy. I mean, it's practically how I met my husband, Ralph. He swaggered over to the creep beside me at the bar and whispered into his ear, Fuck off, I'm connected. At the time, I thought it was hot. But now that my husband and his ego have both doubled in size, it's just a question of what will get him first. A heart attack or a Rico indictment? What guy? I asked. As if it could be anyone other than the purple-suited Haitian man with face tattoos and golden jewelry staring at us from across the food court. His teeth glittered when he smiled at us. 
He's coming over here. Ralph cracked his knuckles and neck like he always did when he was nervous. Before I could slip away to the bathroom, the purple-suited man had boxed us into the table. Andre, my husband hissed. I thought I killed you. Did you? Andre's voice sure sounded dead. Pure monotone, come to think of it. His face looked pretty cadaverous as well. Although that might have been the case before my husband stabbed him five times in the chest with an ice pick. Ice is also what I thought of when Andre grabbed my wrist with a frigid hand and brought it to his jugular. There's no pulse. Nothing. Why don't you ask your wife what she thinks? I think he's dead, babe, I whispered, hoping that would make Andre let me go. His gold ring was even colder than his skin, and it cut into my fingers. The man I thought I married would have pistol-whipped Andre right there in the middle of the food court for touching his wife, cops or no cops. But Ralph just kept sweating and eyeballing mall security. Hey, man, Ralph shrugged. Leave the family out of this. This is between you and me. Men's business. No need to make it personal. My husband, who has less emotional intelligence than a rectal thermometer, seemed to not realize that he'd already made it pretty personal when he killed the guy. Daddy? Ralphie Jr. looked ready to wet his pants when Andre's pale eyes drifted over him. Like father, like son. At least the security people were on the way over. Married to a mafioso, and I was about to be saved by a mall cop. Story of my life. At least he was kind of cute. Andre leaned forward so that his unbuttoned shirt fell open, treating us all to a front row view of the five putrid black holes in his chest. I don't need to sleep, Ralph. I don't need to eat, or drink, or even shit. Do you believe that? All I have to do, Andre grinned, is make your life a living hell. Until I decide to take it away. With that, Andre let me go. He put his hands above his head from all security as he passed, don't shoot style, and laughed a hollow laugh. The laugh of the dead. Then he was gone. This can't be happening, Ralph started repeating as soon as we got to the SUV. Andre was a nobody, a pimp, an addict, small-time dealer who tried to cut in on the wrong hustle. They poured a concrete slab on top of where we buried him, for Christ's sake. Very next day. The cops had the car bugged. I could forget about our upcoming trip to Cancun. On the drive home, Ralph's face went from irritated purple to terrified pale as he called the guys. One by one, they each failed to pick up. Probably already gotten their little visit from Andre, the walking corpse, and decided to skip town. So much for blood, brotherhood. Why save you for last? I asked. Because it was my idea, Ralph admitted. He was selling on my turf. We didn't set an example. I turned the radio up until I couldn't hear my husband's excuses and kept it that way until we parked in the driveway. I wasn't trying to become an accessory to murder. If Andre's goal was to suck all the joy out of our lives, it worked. We spent every waking moment waiting for him to show up. Ralph, too. Although he'd never admit it. He sat in front of the TV with a pistol in one hand and a cold brew in the other and jumped at every little sound. I was the one who had to clean the plates from his stress eating. And that was how I came face to face with Andre for the second time. I don't know how long his face was pressed against the glass staring at me, but when I looked up, those sunken eyes were inches away from mine. I screamed. I, I think I actually threw the dish rag at the window. But Andre didn't budge. Of course, by the time I got Ralph up and moving, he disappeared once again. Ralph didn't believe that I'd actually seen him. A woman's overactive imagination, he called it. He said the same thing about the creaking noises we heard on the roof that night. I called them footsteps. He called them the house settling. He found the smoke and flames coming from the burning ceiling a few hours later a little harder to explain away, however. So how about it, babe? I snarled at him as I pulled out my pink fluffy bathrobe and dragged Ralphie Jr. out of our burning home. Did my overactive imagination set the house on fire too? 
The fireman, who called our hotel room later, said that someone had poured gasoline all over our roof. I didn't have to ask who the second call was from. The one that came around 3 a.m. same night. I'm going to take everything from you. Andre's rasping voice boomed from the phone speaker until it filled the room. Piece by piece. Same as you did to me. Ralph had to go meet with the insurance people alone. There'd been some nasty insinuations about fraud, and yet our lawyer was suddenly nowhere to be found. In the meantime, I took Ralphie Jr. to the dingy 90s-style arcade and the hotel pool. It's funny. All his expensive toys were burned to a crisp. But there he was, having the time of his life. I actually started to think this might all work out in the end. After all I'd been through, I was still kicking, with diamonds in my earrings and a hotel bar mojito in my hand, no less. Ralph was back from the meeting, too, laying in the deck chair beside me like a sunburned, snoring whale. And Ralphie Jr. Where was Ralphie Jr.? The last I'd seen of him, he was doing a cannonball into the deep end. The mojito hit me hard when I stood up, and harder still when I saw the unbreathing man holding my son against the bottom of the pool. Andre looked up at me and grinned. Then he let Ralphie Jr. go. For once, I was grateful for my son's extra ballast. He came up right away, sputtering and screaming. Andre strolled out from the depths of the pool. He walked over to Ralph, and in a move that was surprisingly deft for a corpse, he pulled my husband's swim trunks down and knotted them around his ankles. Ah! Ralph snored awake. Ah! He saw Andre, tried to stand, and face planted. Andre walked out of the hotel with my husband in hot pursuit. The desk clerk didn't even look up from his phone. The kind of place where a dripping guy in a purple suit, being chased to the lobby by an obscene naked Italian man, wasn't such an unusual occurrence. I stayed with Ralphie Jr. trying to get the water out of his lungs, which probably hadn't gotten a workout like this since the last time he'd chased the ice cream truck. I got to my feet quick, though, when I heard a familiar engine rumble to life. The dead guy was stealing my SUV. Since the car and my husband were both lost causes, I went up to the room where my worst fears were confirmed. While we'd been getting a tan, Andre had cleaned us out. Like most in his line of work, my husband kept his money in hard cash and jewelry. But the keys to our safe and deposit boxes were gone too. I suddenly wondered how much was left on our only remaining credit card after all the mojitos. There was a putrid smell coming from the bathroom. All of our clothes were in the tub, soaking in a brown, blue gunk that I recognized as the guts of a porta potty. Andre must have hauled it up by the bucket full. I had to hand it to the guy. He didn't skimp when it came to revenge. That was what finally broke Ralph. Realizing it was all gone, the house, the money, his friends, even his clothes. He wasn't connected anymore. He was a helpless nobody. Just like Andre had been. Maybe that was the point. I don't think any of us were surprised when the knock on the hotel room door came at midnight. Oh, when Ralph shuffled over to answer it without even trying to defend himself. I don't know what happened to Ralph after he left with Andre that night. I don't want to know. All I know is that I never saw my husband again. But hey, I can't complain. At least Andre didn't fuck around with the life insurance policy. Hey there kids, it's me, Miss Squeeze Pasta, and I'm just going to tell you about one quick thing before we get started on tonight's story, and that's going to be about chilling. I talked to you guys about chilling before. Uh, it's an app that I do voice stuff for, so if you're used to listening to me here, uh, you can also listen to me tell stories that you don't hear here, uh, but they're ad-free on Chilling. Chilling is also doing a giveaway. Giveaway is currently for a PS5, uh, so I know those are hard as shit to find. <laughs> if you guys want to get yourself a PS5, head over to chillingapp.com slash PS5, or I'm going to put the link in the description down below. All you got to do is start your free trial of Chilling. 
uh, leave a review on the App Store or on Google Play, and then you complete that little survey that you see on the website. And you could win a PS5. You could win a whole bunch of chilling stickers and Ghosts of Tsushima for the PS5, which I have played, and I can tell you right now is absolutely worth the time to just start a trial and fill out a form. So, yeah. Check out Chilling, everybody. It's available for Apple. It's available for Android. It's available for everything. Check it out. It's got a free trial that you can use through the link in the description down below. And now, on to tonight's story. My grandmother has been catatonic for the last five years. On the night that Grandpa died, her neighbors called the police to come check on her. They said that she was screaming loud enough to be heard three houses down. And when the paramedics arrived, she had ruptured something in her throat. Grandpa was dead in the bed they shared. It was a heart attack. And as they zipped Grandpa into the black bag that would take him to the morgue, they carried Grandma out in a stretcher. After that, she wouldn't speak. She wouldn't move. She just lay in bed and stared at the ceiling of her room in the Shady Lane nursing home. My grandma always was a strong lady. She was fed mechanically. She wears diapers that an orderly has to change. The physical exercise she gets comes in the form of a physical therapist, moving her legs for her as she lays in bed. If she leaves the room, it's because Denise or Reggie, the only two orderlies who seem to give a crap about the residents, lift her into her wheelchair and take her outside or to the resource room, which is really just a fancy word for the TV room. I begin my story this way so that you'll know how weird today's events were. I'm a 35-year-old father of two. I've been married since I was 27 to the love of my life. I thought that after eight years of marriage and raising children, nothing could get to me like it did today. I'm sitting at my computer with a bottle of scotch by my elbow and a sinking fear of returning to my marriage bed. It all started when I went to go visit my grandma today. So my family has a system. Mom and dad go to visit grandma on Monday. I go to visit on Wednesday. My little sister Lisa goes on Friday. And we all go to visit on Sunday after church. My wife doesn't go every time, but she comes with me sometimes. She's known Grandma since we were 17, and she remembers her before her current condition. She wasn't particularly close with Grandma, but I think that she likes to be there for me. You know? My Grandma and I have always been close. I love my Grandma, and I don't want to waste the time I might have left with her, whether she knows I'm there or not. It's a thought that counts. Not over that much. I went on my lunch break today to see her. Reggie was there when I came in, and he gave me a big smile as he finished fussing with her pillows. It always warms my heart to see you and your sister coming to visit your old Graham, he said. He let me know how her vitals were, told me about the doctor visit that she'd had last week, and then he said that he'd leave us to our visit. Just me and my grandma. I took out my lunch, made some one-sided small talk as I ate. I read somewhere that coma patients are aware that someone's talking to them, and in some cases, it sometimes helped them come out of their coma. My grandma wasn't in a coma, no one really knew what was going on with grandma, but I like to think that maybe one day she'd come out of it and thank me for all the lovely visits. She'd say that it was my voice that had kept her going all these years. Pretty sure my sister just played on her phone the whole time that she was here. And I'd feel like I had helped Grandma in some way while she was going through this troubled time. Be careful what you wish for, I guess. I was just telling Grandma about a client I had helped at work when she suddenly inhaled sharply and exhaled in a rattling skeletal way. I paused, my hand still holding hers as it usually did. I was about to get Reggie, and suddenly the hand tightened spasmatically. She made another of those rattling breaths, her eyes rolling wildly. She was like a frightened horse looking for an escape. And though it was the middle of the day, I felt a cold chill run through me as she shuddered and gasped in pure terror. His hands, she breathed out. The hands of the dead. I pulled back suddenly, letting go of her clenched hand. Grandma, are you okay? Listen to me, I don't have much time, Bug. She was awake. Her face was pale and thin, her hands little more than fleshy claws, but she was awake. She was looking at me in that way that people look at fire exits in an inferno. And I tried to get up. She reached out again and took my hand in her cold, damp embrace. I wanted to get Reggie. Reggie would know what to do. 
but the naked want on her face held me in place. I knew I wasn't going anywhere. She'd called me Bug. That had always been her nickname for me, and when she said it, I realized how much I wanted to hear her say it again. Please, Bug, I need to tell you what he said. You need to know, she said frantically, almost pleading, and my knees set me down without thinking. This is what she told me. They had been in bed together when it happened. Both were at that advanced age where laying together was just that. The two were in bed sleeping, just being with each other when Grandad's shuddering had woken her up. His arms had been around her and her back had been against his front. I know from familiarity that this was how they'd always slept, since they were married at seventeen. The position was as natural as sleep itself. His shuddering had woken her up. His hands were grasping at me. His fingers were together like, like a pair of mittens, and he was opening and closing like slow, pained machines. His mouth was against my ear, and his breath was raspy and panting. He sounded like he'd been running, and as he bucked around, I knew he must, he must have been having a heart attack. Your granddad's health hadn't been good for a while, but as I tried to break free of his arms, he held me tight, leaned his mouth in close. No, Ellie, don't go, please. I'm scared, Ellie, I'm scared, he said, and God help me, he sounded terrified. Don't be scared, Roy, I told him. You'll be okay. I'll call Dr. Stevens and he'll... I can't see, Ellie. That's what he said to me. I can't see, Ellie. They say you see the light or you hear a voice, but I can't see, Ellie. It's all black. It's all just black. And I can't see his face or hear his voice. He gripped me then hard. I felt his nails through my nightshirt, and as he did it, his heart, his heart attack was bad. I was terrified that he wouldn't come through this time. I tried to break free. I tried to get loose, but his arms were so rigid, I couldn't get away. The whole time, he was just panting and telling me how there's nothing there, and it's all just black, and, and he knows... He knows there's nothing there. He kept right on repeating it, even as his voice went out. And then he leaned in close until his lips were on my ear, and his he breathed one final time. That was the first time I screamed. I screamed because I was in the arms of a dead man. He was gone, Bug. He breathed his last breath, and that was that. But now I was caught in his last embrace. Her voice took on a tenuous, hysterical sound, and I remember thinking that somewhere a machine must be going off, somewhere telemetry must be telling someone how her heart was racing along too fast. Someone, somewhere, must be on their way with a crash cart or, or a doctor or a shot to calm her down, because in this room, she was so close to hysterics. I wanted to get that shot. As many times as I would prayed to God to hear her speak again, I wanted to see that man come through the door with a shot so that she would slip back off again. As much as I wanted her back, I knew this was not okay. At that moment, I wanted her back in her catatonic state. I wanted this jittery, hysterical creature out of pain. I pulled at his hands, those strong hands that would take mine sometimes, and they were hands of stone. They'd locked in death, and now I couldn't separate them. His weight was a stone around me, and I was... I was afraid, Buck. I was afraid I'd never get loose and they'd find us both dead right here. Him of a heart attack and me, a, a just of plain old starvation. I... Her voice broke. And when she closed her hurting green eyes, I saw the tears spill out. I had to break his finger. They sounded like dry twigs when they crack in the fire, and after I'd broken four of them, I almost had his hands apart. 
That's when he came back, she whispered, as though he might hear her. Her words made my blood run cold. He'd been dead for five minutes, Bug. His chest was close enough. I could feel nothing beating, but all of a sudden, his arms tightened around me and he screamed into my ear like a wolf in a trap. He pulled me hard against him. I felt my ribs trying to break. And all of a sudden, he was bucking and thrashing like the devil himself had a hold of him. It burns! It burns, Ellie! He kept screaming and screaming it into my ear. When I finally thrust his hands apart, I rolled out of bed. I got as far from it as I could, and that's where they found me, Bug. They found me in the corner. They found me screaming. I don't know what was burning him, but I saw... I saw his last few minutes before he went out again. He writhed, he screamed, he died in agony. What kind of place had he been in that would make him scream like that, I thought. What kind of place? What kind of place? What kind of place? She kept right on mumbling that phrase again and again and again until I couldn't take it anymore. I got up, I walked out as fast as I could, and I never looked back. I don't know what I'll do next time I have to see her. I didn't want to go back to work. I called my boss. I told him I wasn't feeling well. I needed to go home. And he let me. He's a good man. And when I called Reggie later that afternoon, he told me that she was right as rain as usual. When he'd given her her meds that afternoon, she was still lying in bed, staring at the ceiling as always. He never hinted at any change in telemetry. Never said a word about abnormal vitals, just told me how much he knew it meant to her that I came and visited. And now I'm sitting at my computer. I don't know what to do. I've been sitting here for about an hour and contemplated how I'll get on with the rest of my life, knowing my grandfather's agony and my grandmother's terror at the end of his life. I've been contemplating how I'm going to climb in bed with my wife tonight. A problem that seems to be more here and now. I see the thought of her wrapping her arms around me, placing her chest against my back, making me want to shudder right out of my skin. What would I do if she woke me up in the throes of a heart attack? What would I do if she whispered those same hopeless words into my ear before she died? What would I do if I found myself trapped in the embrace of my own dying love? Good evening once again, kids. It's me, Mr. Creepypasta. And I want to tell you thank you for watching tonight's video. Or for listening to tonight's episode of the podcast. That's available on Spotify. Or on Apple Music or on uh, um, any any other places that you can get podcasts. I'm not I'm not entirely sure where people listen to podcasts. Uh, if you guys are watching on YouTube, though, I would really appreciate if you click the subscribe button, click that thumbs up button, and hit the bell for me, because that's what we're supposed to say now. We're required by YouTube law. As always, I want to give a big thank you to all of my supporters on Patreon. You guys are the real MVPs, and you allow us to get a whole bunch of custom stories that are only heard here on this channel, on this podcast. So, a very big thank you to Jordan Alexander Sanchez, Stephanie Butler, Bobby Carmen, Tristan Pelton, Chase Burnett, Diana Krause, Maria Walker, Tanya Oren, Payne Gravy, Inactive Hermit, Austin Johnson, Crazy Kid, Mr. Marcus Blitz, Aka Limchok, Dirt Diver 030, Matt Bach, Jabbles Raz, Voice of Sand, Coffee Zombie, Matthew McNeese, Shelly J, Jeremy H, Raltazal, Ficomel, Nana, The Morgan, Nick Weaver, Melted Lake, Tali Sue, Sky Maria Ravenswood, William King, Reaper 61167, Darth Miver, Micah Ortiz, Satanic Aries, Nessie, Parafa Panda, Bardo Hawk 764, Lambda M98, Harley, Billy Morrow, Sashi Suzaku, My Body Sounds Like Rice Krispies, Miss Xander, Suji Campbell, Stricken, Azarine Fox, Freddy Krueger, Happy Birthday Jason Wilson, Lisa Cottrell, Caspian, Hades Nephew, Tater Chip, Acid System, Prozac and Pancake Appreciation Society, Cryptic Nightmares, Kiri the Sloth, Tommy Green, Fester's Lampshade, Sky Harbor, Nico Kyle, Rafael Rodriguez, The Ginger Bros, Aaron Stormcrow, Daniel Polson, Trace Miles, and Corey Kenshin.
And of course, everybody who's down there in the description as well, and everybody who can support on patreon.com slash mrcreepypasta for even one dollar, I appreciate it greatly, and I'm sure that all the authors that we were able to work with appreciate it too. So, thank you guys so much, thank you for listening, and sweet dreams.